So talk about talk about IKEA. Yes. So I went to IKEA for the very first time, very first time in my life, uh, like All last right, Saturday. So I'm gonna live this. I'm gonna live this out vicariously through you right now because I've actually never been. So, so. you well, okay. yeah, they have that new one near you guys, so yes. you can change that soon, Colin. Yeah, they just Fair opened enough. up one in Columbus, um, and it was it was a thing when it opened up. Like the day it opened, the grand opening, I think it was like a Wednesday. Like they had cops directing traffic. Dang, <laughs> what? Went around the, yeah, no, this, what? This, it was a holiday. Yeah. Like no, it's there's huge. probably like balloons in the air. Goodyear blimp probably flying over top. Oh yeah, it was it was a magnificent event. Um, I decided to go after all of that, um, and I thought maybe it would like die down a little bit. No, it was the, there were still people directing traffic like through the parking wow, lot, like dang. through the parking lot, just to tell you, like, okay, you can park here or park there or whatever. Yeah. Um. So when I walked in, I didn't really know what to expect. Like I knew what IKEA was, you know, furniture. Right. But I didn't realize how magical it it would feel. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's an experience. Yeah. They sell you an experience. Make no mistake. Breathing that IKEA air, I I feel <laughs> a little closer to <laughs> being a wizard, you know. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I didn't even get to try the meatballs. So I'm not being sold on meatballs. I'm just being sold on looking at all that ergonomic, aesthetic Swedish furniture. There's nothing wrong with those meatballs. Those are some I, good meatballs. No, yeah, I've, I've heard they're good. But I, what I'm trying they to say is like... They sell meatballs at Ikea? <laughs> Absolutely. There's a cafeteria what? there. Yo, no, that's, that's, cafeteria like there. Their, that's their thing. It's, yeah, spoilers for Colin. Hey, Colin, just go. <laughs> just plug your ears for the rest of this conversation and just go. <laughs> Yeah, all right, I'm so, all right. I'm already sold because yeah. meatballs. Leave They're right now. Swedish meatballs. <laughs> Just leave what? right now. Yeah. Jack and I will banter for the next like hour and a half. We'll cover for you. Yeah, come back with some flat <laughs> yeah. pack furniture. Get get like a queen size bed for seventeen dollars. Yeah, who cares? Dude, my my apartment's fully furnished, but who gives a shit? I'll just replace it all with IKEA just furniture. Burn it, it to the ground. Yeah, no, you, <laughs> you don't understand. I want to replace everything I own with IKEA furniture. That's a for real thing. I know the feeling. I know the feeling. If I could replace my body with Ikea, I would. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so you didn't get the meatballs, but tell us more. Okay, so I let's see. I'm in the market for like a new desk and a new chair, like a new desk chair. Man, I was trying to sell you a desk. Yeah, I know. But back back (laughs) then, I wasn't. I wasn't in the market for a desk then, and I also wasn't aware of the magic in the world. Understood. I still sold it, but man, you could have gotten a good deal. Okay, go ahead. (laughs) Fair enough. Um, No, so I I looked at a couple of the desks there, and I just I I think I fell in love. I think that was the first time I've fallen in love with something that can't breathe. It's it was a beautiful moment. <laughs> like you know, like love at first sight. It was kind of like love at first seat. Wow! Yeah, you Turn sit the in, lights down. <laughs> oh man! You sit Let's in the chair candles while you're talking. Oh man! Like wow. their IKEA Marcus chair that felt that felt incredible. Yeah. That was I, the chair I was trying to sell you, dude. That was literally the chair. <laughs> look, look, missed opportunities. All right, it was yeah. <laughs> missed opportunities. Just saying. Just saying. Okay. So yeah. Okay. I uh, basically I'm a pansexual now or an IKEA sexual. Um, wow. I, I get it. I get all of the hype. It's just you and Miley Cyrus now. <laughs> please. <laughs> just please go just go get the IKEA like logo tattooed right on your ass. <laughs> like just property of I'm IKEA. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say don't do that as a friend. <laughs> I, I think I'll I'll get a tramp stamp of it. I think that'd be a little classier. Perfect. All right, there oh you my, go. Yeah. <laughs> Can only imagine, and some meatballs so on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I know there's someone out there, someone out there with IKEA Swedish meatballs tattooed somewhere. I guarantee. <laughs> I venture, I venture to guess. So, so Dude, what did the, you buy? What did you leave with? Uh, I left with uh, pretty much nothing. I bought some straws. <laughs> <laughs> what? Dude, those, like, listen, those will save you. Like, like I was getting judged actually when I because the bag of straws is like a dollar, and I was getting judged yeah. for that. And then they saved our butt multiple times. I'm like, aren't you glad now I bought these straws? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, because we have a bar in our apartment, so it's like it's per- like we use the straws on a pretty daily basis. Well, and one um, of the worst, sorry, but one of the most egregious, like the wrongest wrong someone can do you is when you get home from the drive thru and you're ready to eat, sit down, and you discover only then and there that you are strawless. Yeah, that is a bad feeling. No it's one wants to be like dealing worst. with the ice and the lid and all that crap. Okay, yeah, sorry, I used to drink a glass like a normal human yeah. being. Um, the straw is not in the bag. They tell you the straw is in the bag, but it's not in the bag. And like, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, I also bought a really, really all right pillow. It was just okay, really. Okay. I, I didn't okay. want to spend too much because I didn't want to commit that much since I'm moving mm-hmm. soon. 
Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And I think it's when I moved, like what, what that trip was, that was a planning trip. It was for me to find out what I could find. And then the next time I go there, I will probably be bankrupt. Um, yeah. Understood. I won't, won't have any money after that. Wait, so my question is, what what the hell do they sell other than furniture? You said they sell straws? Like, what uh, else do they sell It's, like, it's like literally, like, I think it's a company, like, they just sell anything that you can put in and around a house. It's okay. in Ikea. Here, here's the thing. Here, here's something that blew my mind. So they have a extensive light fixtures and, like, lamps section. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And okay. they have these lights that hang from the ceiling. And it's like, you know, it's like a sphere at first. Oh, uh, I know what you're going to say. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then and then you can pull a drawstring and the sphere like expands and explodes in a very like symmetrical like kind of yeah, aesthetic. it kind of looks like the matrix of truth that keeps Optimus <laughs> Prime alive basically, it's, but it's, it's like, a you lamp. Know, it's like you know those blinders on your window? Like imagine a 3D version of that. <laughs> like a just a 3D version. It's it's pretty sweet. I I'm not going to lie. You got to see it for yourself, but I can't wait to hear Colin's reaction when you go there, man. So they th- they thought the company thought that I still lived in Ohio and I do not, but they mailed me a like golden like hex wrench, Allen wrench. And they're like come to the store during this event and put it in this one machine and crank it and if you and if you're the winner or whatever, then you get like a $100 IKEA card. That's pretty so, cool. Yeah, so I should have mailed that to you. Sorry, <laughs> but I just threw <laughs> no. it away instead. I was like, ah, no one needs this. Yeah, there's, no our, one. there's an IKEA twenty minutes from me here. So yeah, is is this an amusement park? Like, <laughs> dude, make you. It will take uh, you could take a day there easily. Like, mm-hmm. hey, you know what, Colin? Hey, go on an <laughs> IKEA date. I've heard good things. What? I've heard good things about going going to IKEA f- as a for a date. Seriously, no Can't shit. Convert. I'm I'm just gonna take my girlfriend there. I'd be like, dude. I'm saying come down and be like, we're going to Ikea. She's like, yeah, why? Be like, come back and trust report. me. Yeah. We're going to Ikea. <laughs> uh, so welcome to TDP, the Tiny hey Disc now, Podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. Uh, it's a show about games and life. I'm your host, Robert Scarpinito, and I do not have an Ikea tramp stamp. Um, and I'm joined here by <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Jack Cepeda. Hey, everybody. I, I can't even go on anymore. <laughs> like, <it's- laughs> This podcast is, ru- is running the ground already. <laughs> yeah, We're getting off to a great start, guys. <laughs> and uh, also Colin Sparling. I'm going to make a Kickstarter or like a GoFundMe for this tramp stamp. <laughs> We're going to make... <laughs> it's, We're gonna do make you really need to? It'd only be like 80 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I want this to be the... like No, I want this to be the most like eccentric, like most detailed IKEA tramp stamp you've ever seen in your entire life. And it's, Honestly, it's gonna I have, think... Like, I think Snakes Ikea should pay for it. roses all around it, like typical tattoo fair. Oh, no. I think Ikea should, would pay for that, I think, if someone would get their <laughs> name tattooed on them. Dude, just tweet at them just to be like, hey, Ikea, do you want to pay for my, my, my Ikea trans stamp? <laughs> Officially sponsored. <laughs> how many, how many dec- retweets? <laughs> how many retweets? <laughs> I had a decent story to tell, but like it doesn't really like live up to the Ikea trip story. But, yeah, so welcome yeah. to the Ikea cast. <laughs> Um, when we talk only about Ikea for the next hour and a half, at least. That's all it needs. <laughs> That's all we need. I can't uh, wait to hear Colin report back when he comes back. Oh, I'm excited. It'll happen within the next week or two. Yeah, that's that's your homework now. Like, next episode, we're expecting it. Yeah, I want to hear how long it took you to put the uh, the drawer together. Yep. I don't know. Like, I've seen, like, I saw Robert snap at the place, man, and I'm just, I'm intimidated. <laughs> I, it just, it looks so large. It's an experience. It's, it's a huge building too. Anyway, That's what I'm saying enough about IKEA. <laughs> let's get let's get into some uh, some topics here. So uh, you guys heard about the Han Solo film? Yeah, I was looking forward to it, and then when I found out when I found out who they casted for it, I was like, oh, I don't know. And then I saw who they had as directors, and I was like, oh, they have some pretty good movies. Lego Movie, Twenty One Jump Street. Like, okay, this could end up well. Mm-hmm. And. Then I think it was what earlier today, right, or yesterday maybe, uh, Lucasfilm kind of let Phil Lord and Christopher Miller go. They just kind of push the directors away due to quote creative differences. That's so crazy to me because I I read the story as well and they were talking about how there's only about three weeks or so left in development and they how can you get so deep into film. Uh, production and then have them drop at that point. You know what I mean? Wouldn't you know by that point whether or not you're going to get along? Shouldn't you kind of figure that out and iron that out when you're hiring directors? It's just really crazy and I'm concerned about the film more so than I was before because I already didn't think that the uh, actor that they um, 
cast for Han Solo's part was was a great choice. And now I'm just like, oh, man, what's going to happen? Yeah. What's worrying, too, is like when you when you're changing your director this close to when you're done with your principal filming, like it makes me wonder how many like dirty cuts there are going to be or, you know, like scenes that feel really out of place because, you know, like you filmed all this footage with these two directors who had a vision and then, you know, your last three weeks of filming is going to be, you know, under a different director, under a different vision. And it's just going to feel like a clashing of messages, I think. Yeah, I think uh, like I mean, like, like like we read Rogue One already had a lot of reshoots. Right. So, yeah, um, let's just hope like it doesn't end up like a Suicide Squad <laughs> because everyone knows how that DC turned movie. out. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Like it like, like Jack said, like, I mean, you said it, man, it the fact that they waited so long to figure out that they just had no chemistry and they they just butted heads like oh yeah it's the cliche of creative differences blah 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 we're just not gonna do the thing anymore and now that's just kind of hanging there in purgatory yeah speaking of purgatory is production just hanging in limbo now is anyone you know running the show what's going on now no directors you had two of them now you have zero is someone gonna swoop in and and assume that director role well, here's the thing. They said um, even though they're letting these two directors go, they're still slated for a May 2018 release date for the film. So they're adamant about this not stopping production or like slowing down production in any way. This will be the closest that two Star Wars movies kind of launch too, right? Like the next episode uh, eight is in yeah. December and then you only have five months like... I mean, I love my Star Wars, but I've never had to, you know, released in, in theaters so closely together. You're kind of used to, you're used to it being a three year thing, right? With the, with the second trilogy or, you know, even the first trilogy, they were years apart. And now we are on the cycle where there's one a year and now it's going to be even increase. So I don't know. It's looking, it's looking worrisome. I'm, I'm hoping the best, but I always had a little bit of misgivings about this Han Solo film from the get go. And now I'm just like really in panic mode. So don't know, but I am looking forward to episode eight. Mm. Episode eight looks sweet. Ryan Johnson is directing that who uh, directed Looper. I don't know if you guys ever saw that movie. I've heard uh, good things. No, that's, I didn't a, see that's it. an awesome I movie. It. Yeah, I, it was on Netflix. Who knows if it is anymore, but Looper is a, a fantastic film. And also Ryan Johnson directed um, uh, one or two episodes of Breaking Bad too. some of the best episodes in that whole series. So for fans of Breaking Bad. Like we have a lot to look forward to. I think this uh, this holiday season when episode eight comes out, I'm 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 really hyped about that film. Wait, he just directed like one or two episodes of Breaking Bad. Why just one or two episodes? Because he's Ryan Johnson. He's in demand. I don't know. They they have oh. yeah they oh. have multiple you know um, directors uh, per season for that series. And man, oh I I honestly didn't know that. Yeah, Breaking Bad is. Oh, one of the best TV series. Oh, Anyways, so I digress. Good. It really, really is. It's so yeah. Good. I yeah, could yeah. Wa- I could rewatch the whole um see, uh, series from beginning to end. Like right now, like I'm kind of due to watch it again. I've only seen the whole series one time through, so it's kind of it's almost time. But uh, looping back to the Star Wars thing, so you mentioned Jack that you were a little worried about. Um, well, you're worried about the Han Solo film in general, but you also kind of yeah. expressed a little bit of concern about like fi- like there's only going to be a five month gap between right two Star Wars films. Granted, one of them's a spinoff, but you know. Right. still got that Star Wars brand. Um, so I think that might kind of beg the question, you know, like, is is there a point where a franchise gets so big and it's going on for so long with so many, like, extra things happening that it kind of feels maybe like oversaturation? Um, oversaturation, yes. Um, I th- the, here's the thing, though. Like, Star Wars is one of those things where, like, Star Wars is such a cash cow, right? Like, it... Star Wars is such it's so big it's larger than life at this point so anything I mean you slap Star Wars on it man it's gonna make money that's just how it is you yeah, know I mean, look at uh, Battlefront 2 yeah <laughs> right hey that looks uh, like a good game get you yeah. man that game was cool <laughs> <laughs> hate squad dude no but like I will not hear it I will not hear it <laughs> Star Wars though like yeah it's definitely like one of those too big to fail things I never even thought like I never thought in a million years that we're going to make an episode 7 to be quite honest with you before they even announced it um, <clears throat> I think that was many people though right yeah like I thought you know it was going to be you know we had the original series and the prequels and then I just, I just thought that was it like I mean we were, we were getting all the cartoons and all that stuff that was kind of like uh, fluffing up the lore that was already there but then they came out with episode 7 they're like oh no the extended universe is not canon anymore 
and they're just like screwing everything up. But then like, you know, episode seven was like, you know, super hype. Everyone was super hyped for episode seven, just like they were episode one before it came out. And then like, you know, everyone's like, oh yeah, episode seven, incredible. And then a few months later, they're like, nah, it's not that good. <laughs> it's basically just episode-, episode seven's not that good. A lot of people, I mean, a lot of people don't like it. Like, what? uh, yeah, because it's just basically a rehash of episode four. I don't know. I think, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and defend that point. Like, yeah, it definitely is a retelling of episode one, but I I haven't heard the backlash on ep- episode seven until this very second. Like, I thought it was kind of well, like generally I'm not, thought I'm of not it saying it's positively. Okay, so I'm not saying it's like bad, but like a lot of people, you know, after the hype kind of died a little bit, they're like, eh, maybe it's not as good as we thought it was. Kind I don't of thing. know. I, I yeah. really like that film. I'm looking forward to the other two mainline Star Wars films, certainly. Uh, way more than I was episode two and episode three. I think that just those movies were so terrible and so like mocked still to this day. Just this morning I read or I saw a meme literally just this morning. It was like uh, one of those um, alphabet pretzel bags. Do you guys yeah. know those? Yeah. And like it was spilled out on a table and the and, and the pretzel spelled out, do you want to hear the legend of Darth Plagueis? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah, like, in pretzels. like that was literally just this morning. So it spawned like so many countless memes like that. That's kind of where those um, movies live on. Right. And and still provide some uh, form of entertainment. However, you know, um, uh, uh, how much fun people want to make of them. But. I think people were just so relieved as well. So I, I will admit this as far as episode seven. I think people were just so relieved that it was good, right? And not terrible like, they, like they've like they known that it might have gotten a few extra brownie points just for being good, not necessarily a great film. But it, it definitely has its moments. It has humor. Um, it has good effects. Uh, Harrison Ford is still a little weird just from all the weed he smokes like <laughs> his entire life. You know, his brain cells are kind of not exactly you know where we remember them from back in the day but you know i think that uh i think that movie was successful like no doubt um commercially but i I think it's a good film i i own it i don't own a lot of physical discs that's one of the movies that i actually bought and own and will watch i mean i I mean dude at the end of the at the end of the day though i will say like star wars is star wars and though it may not be like there there is definitely bad like star wars movies like episode two for example but it's like it's still star wars you know what I mean? It's still like okay. So you say they're bad movies, but it's still Star Wars. You know what I mean? You're, so you're still gonna watch it. That's so the like, thing. That, that's the thing that I debate though. Like, is Episode Two and Episode Three, and to a certain extent Episode One, are those really Star Wars movies? I mean, is Episode Three really that bad though? I really liked Episode Three personally. Mm, it's it's just oh. really liked. Or just I mean, not, uh, not really liked, but I, I liked. Honestly, though, like take away like Hayden Christensen though, and are those movies really that bad? <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel bad for that guy. I just think he was given terrible. No, dialogue, he was victim of a bad direction. script. He really was. You know, get George Lucas off the couch. You know, and 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 make some real films. I don't know. There's there's some really good um, takedown videos. I don't know if you guys have seen the Red Letter Media uh, reviews of the uh, second Star Wars trilogy, Episode One through Three. They just go into so much detail on why those movies are terrible. So I would invite you to check those out and watch it. And and no, literally the reviews for each movie, like he does one for episode one, episode two, episode three. The reviews alone are as long as the movies are. Seriously. Wow. Yeah. They're like two, two and a half hour long reviews. And they are oh my awesome. God. They are awesome. It's kind though. of incredible. Totally worth it. Seriously. Check it out. So uh, yeah, I definitely have to. Um, I will say like. But I, I don't know. Out of, out of you guys, I don't know if I would definitely say, like, I'm as adamant of a Star Wars fan. I was a Lord of the Rings kid, to be fair. So I, I, I lean more towards, like, the high fantasy stuff rather than the sci-fi stuff. Um, but, like, I don't know. But definitely, it, it definitely is one of those franchises that's, like, you slap Star Wars on it, dude. People are going to go buy it. They're going to go watch it, whatever. And um, I will say kind of more so, like, as, like, not, not a hardcore fan perspective, I will say, like, I don't know, this whole idea of doing all these spinoff movies, like, I, I don't know, I kind of felt Rogue One was kind of mm, pointless to me. I don't know if, I don't, oh I don't know. Oh, my you guys can, gosh. You guys can come at me with your torches <laughs> and your pitchforks, but, I mean, I didn't really uh. think it, it, I don't even think it really needed to happen. It really wasn't a necessary film. It wasn't a bad movie. I went and saw it in theaters. I didn't think it was a bad movie. It was a good movie. You're not it, wrong. You're not wrong. It's not necessary. No. But it was I so just, awesome, though. I would I would probably never watch it again. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Jack's going to kill me, dude. <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, that's a good movie. That's a good yeah. movie. 
What do you no, think, no, Robert? I enjoyed, you're so quite, I enjoyed you're watching Star Wars it. Talk. Yeah, I mean, I kind of want to stay out of the Star Wars fandom, personally. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to be in that. Yeah, I mean, you know, everyone knows, everyone knows the best part of Rogue One was the uh, Forrest Whitaker eye, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh man I'm, I'm gonna put this mantle down i don't want to fight this fight right now but rogue one's a good film but yeah if we can move on uh, han solo episode eight we got those coming out this year and yeah they, they are coming out like super close together it's a lot of star wars man you never would have i never would have thought i would have seen the day when so many star wars movies are coming out so close together it's kind of crazy um, I, I wasn't yeah. really hype on the han solo movie like i said until i saw the directors and now the directors are out i'm now i'm like mad worried about it like it's not even really on my radar so much Mm -hmm. even anymore but yeah so let's uh let's move on to what games we've been playing for the past uh week or so jack do you want to start overwatch that lunar colony map just got Mm -hmm. released uh yesterday or two days ago if you're listening to this on thursday and it's good um it's a free map you know so you don't have to down you don't have to subscribe to any kind of uh, season pass or anything like that blizzard just kind of gives their new content out to all players and yeah it's pretty fun probably played a couple hours um maybe a dozen matches or so or so um there's nice verticality elements to it there's um a lot of long long sight lines and so uh robert you and i played together last night we were commenting how um this would be really good like sniper turf to perch yeah. on and yeah, Widowmaker is very strong on that map because there's so many places to sit at and aim from. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they, and there's there's good flanking lanes as well. Um, one of the most notable ones <laughs> is uh, you can kind of go outside of the Lunar Colony and, and be on the surface of the moon, and it's real low anti-grav. And so we had a couple cool stories from that. So if you know Symmetra's turrets, she can lay down six at a time. And to go into that door, I uh, you're, you're just kind of like in this real... Uh, cylindrical short tube and you're kind of trapped there it's it's a real big bottleneck so i just put all the symmetric turrets along the top and along the sides and then our friend max was playing roadhog <laughs> he just <laughs> sat there around the turrets and when uh enemies came by he just hooked them and brought them into it and basically fried them like in split second and that yep. was pretty cool synergy there i thought and frying them in zero g mind you yeah and yeah and, it's, and also it's uh, of note too that when you're out there as well uh sound doesn't happen so you don't hear anything. It's really cool contracts. And then when you walk right back into uh, the, the lunar base, then you start hearing things again, too. I thought that was a cool effect. Um, one thing that happened after you left, Robert, was I was Tracer, and I went towards the first point, and uh, Winston was chasing me down. And obviously, if you're Tracer, you don't want to be anywhere near Winston. So I go back to zero G, and I'm almost dead. I'm going for the health pack out there. Winston's chasing me outside, okay? He makes... And he's about to kill me. He makes the mistake... <laughs> of of uh doing his jump his boost jump and because he's in zero g he goes fly off the map it was so <laughs> hilarious and killed himself and i was like it was, it was one of the funniest things that happened in overwatch a really long time but he thought he was gonna kill me and didn't even think that oh maybe i shouldn't hit this button <laughs> jeez you'd think winston of all characters would know about moon gravity if he's in character, yeah. Yeah. We need to get, <laughs> we need to get into RP servers maybe for this. <laughs> yeah, no, I played uh, I played a bit of that patch too with you, like you said. Um, I I was really interested to see how the new characters would play or how the patches to the characters would play, most notably Reaper, McCree, and Roadhog's patches. Um, and yeah. I have to say, I don't think I hated them as much as I thought I would. I actually kind of really like Reaper now. I feel like he's actually pretty fun to play. He has the, that new ability where he life steals on hit rather than regaining health from the globes after he kills people. Yeah. So it gives him a lot more sustain. It really makes him like a good tank buster, I think, which is what he was kind of always meant to be. Yeah. Um, McCree's ult feels pretty good to use now, too. It doesn't feel just kind of like a joke, you know, like just the it's high noon and you kind of don't care. And then dies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and with Roadhog, th- this is the one that was biggest to me as I was worried that I'd maybe never play Roadhog again, but I think the new patch, he still feels pretty good. It does feel annoying that you can't just hook people and kill them anymore, but yeah. he he's good at like still punishing that. So, you know, if you're like low on health and you're running around in a bad place and then you get hooked, like, you know, you kind of deserve to get hooked. Mm-hmm. So I think I've- that... Oh, oh go ahead. It's just he's all about like bad positioning, you know. Like if if you're in a bad position, he'll punish that. Right. I, the thing about it is that 
Blizzard just has so much analytical data on how these you know these characters are being played on their strengths on when they're dying why they're dying that when they make these um patches uh these fixes to the gameplay i i have to believe it's for a reason i have to believe it's like a decision by committee there isn't one person going around right and like just changing up the game that affects literally tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people so you know i'm I, it sounds weird the roadhog uh, specifically but i'm willing to try it out he's never been like a major character of mine either he's definitely in like my bottom half of the characters that I actually will play. It's very situational. Basically, if we need a Roadhog and no one's willing to do it, I'll pick him up. So that doesn't typically happen. He's one of the more popular characters, I feel, that I run into. Yeah, definitely. Um, Colin, what have you been playing for the past week? Um, I got around to messing around with my Dreamcast a little bit more. Um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, Dreamcast, I, I picked up a complete unbox Dreamcast for all you collector nudes out there uh, a little while back from uh, my friends at Warp Zone here in Columbus cool um, shout out yeah shout out man uh and the the system works great super clean um picked up a couple games for it uh i've collected a couple more games since then i got like soul caliber crazy taxi one and two like oh, classic guys i got a hell of a deal on uh skies of arcadia oh really um yeah dude 50 bucks for skies of arcadia which is a great solid deal. solid uh you can yeah. play shenmue now yeah, I can play Shenmue. I, I'm still waiting to hear whether or not they're going to do the HD remake because there's been so many freaking rumors coming out about that. Um, let me ask you, Colin. Let me ask you. What do you know about that Choo Choo Rocket, son? Choo Choo Rocket? Yeah, you need to get that game. Choo Choo Rocket? Trust me, trust me. Is it is it a freaking uh, like a shoot 'em up or something? No, I'm not going to say anything. It's kind of a puzzle game. It's kind of unique. There's nothing really like it. Um, definitely check it out. All right, yeah, I'll, dude, I'll definitely check it out. I need any anything to play on my Dreamcast, to be honest with you. <laughs> Um, but I did go out of my way to get uh, like an HD converter box and a VGA cable for my Dreamcast. <gasps> I was just gonna say, pro super move. clean, super Sick. clean on my HD TV. Yeah, um, it, you can find all both of those things on Amazon if you just Google uh, or Amazon the uh, Dreamcast VGA cables. They're pretty cheap. They're not too bad. Cool. Um, and then you can just convert uh, it conver- up up converts them so you can use HDMI cable. Uh, so it, it looks pretty pretty nice. All huh. games run at native 48, 480p. Of course, they're a little bo- they're boxed off. They have like the black bars on the side, but they look pretty right. decent. Playing Soul Calibur looks amazing. Um, oh man, I played so much Tony Hawk Two. Dude, on that. Like, I when, need it. I need when, Tony. Yeah, Hawk when Tony Hawk Two was so like you know the game, you know, that right. that year, like I played so much. It's good memories. Lights out, Gorilla Radio. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So do you have any like one big game that you really want to play on the Dreamcast, or is it kind of just you know so, test the waters? I mean, Skies of Arcadia was a really big game because it was the JRPG that uh, on the Dreamcast that everyone talks about. Like, oh, Skies of Arcadia is like amazing. And I've played a little bit of it so far, and it's it's like presentation wise, it's amazing. And I, I couldn't imagine playing it back then because I think it would just be mind blowing. Um, the thing about the Dreamcast though is like it, it has like a certain pizzazz to it like it has like the, a certain way like a certain feel to the graphics that just it has a certain appeal to it that grabs you it, it may not have like the best visuals of like all time but it's like it's super uh i don't know what the word the word i'm looking for is but it's just i don't know it's something about it just makes me gravitate towards it man uh it's like 128 bit console yeah them low polys man uh everything <laughs> looks so square any <laughs> um San Francisco Rush, Hydro Thunder, yeah, Virtual Hydro on, Thunder, Virtual on yeah, Ontario dude. Tangram. But dude, yeah, I, I will say like Dark so, Stalkers. Uh, so I mean the, the the coolest thing about the Dreamcast though, it just has like these little quips to it. Like everything from like the VMUs to like how loud the system is. It's so ridiculously <laughs> Yours loud. Is loud? I never I never had that issue before. Did you um do you do you, did you get a VMU? Yeah, I have two of them. Are you feeding your your Tamagotchi or whatever it is? Oh uh, no, I, I see. I think um, the I know exactly what you're talking about, but I think the problem I'm running into right now is I think the batteries are dead in them. So I think I need to get new new batteries for them so I can. They well, can yeah, if it's own. from like 1999, yeah, they're right, dead. Right, <laughs> exactly. Nine nine ninety nine. Remember yeah. the date. Um, yeah, so I, I think I need to throw new batteries in them because I haven't been able to do like the standalone. But that's the cool thing, man. They come with the VMUs. They have like the uh, a little display icon for whatever game you're playing when you have them inside the controller. And then when you take them out, they got little buttons on them. You can play mini games like feed your Tamagotchi pets. A new quip that I found out. I don't know if anybody knew about this, 
but or uh, how many people know about this but like so there's certain games where you can put the game in the dreamcast right and you know it does this usual whirr, like it's really loud because it sounds like an old computer like really loud clanking and like running sounds um and if you ter- put the disc in and you go to the main menu and you go to the cd section you can actually play the game soundtrack right off the game disc without actually going into the game really yeah and not all games do it but there's some like uh the one i have rip and riders which is like an old like an old like snowboarding game which is a lot of fun um you can put it in and it's got like one of those old, like straight out of the 90s like slow electronics type soundtracks with just the the drum and bass like just really just really nice to put on in the background and the cool thing is if you put it like if you play a cd or whatever like the screen darkens on the like the dreamcast screen and then it shows like a little light show while you're listening to music and just like little i love little stuff like that but like if you put in some discs have easter eggs on them so like uh skies of arcadia if you put it in uh the dreamcast and you put and you access the cd section it'll be like hey what do you think you're doing this disc doesn't belong in a cd player yeah put our disc back in the dreamcast so we can do our jobs like (laughs) that's cute yeah yeah they had funny i i remember uh Tekken 2, I want to say, had a really funny message as well, too, if you try to put it in a CD player. But uh, kind of fun fact, any uh, disc-based game with Red Book audio, that's basically just CD audio. It's basically WAV files, so you can pl- throw them in your CD player and technically have the soundtrack for free. I remember a bunch of games on PS1 oh, really? did that as well. Yeah, any any uh, CD-based game with Red Book audio, I believe. Nice. Yeah. I've, yeah, I've actually... never tried that with a PS1 game. I'm sorry, Robert, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I've actually been playing a game that has a really good soundtrack. If you don't mind oh, yeah. me jumping oh, in here. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, Killing Floor 2. I've been playing a bunch of that for the past week. Uh, last week for the E3 episode, I mentioned that Killing Floor 2 is free for the week. Um, it's over now. So, you have to buy it at full price if you want to play it. But Which is what? Oh, 30 bucks, I believe. Okay. Money, money, money. Yep. Is, it only on, is it only on PC or is it on console? Yeah. So, here's the thing. It's on PC <laughs> and PS4. It was in early access for like the longest time, but it was officially released November 2016. So, it is like an official, like, you know, full game. Um, and it it plays very well. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Killing Floor is, it's like, a, I mean, it's your basic zombie, you know, like horde mode, like wave based shoot em up. You know, just kill all the zombies, make all the money, and then buy bigger guns, and then kill more zombies, and so on. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. It's not just regular zombies, right? It's like clown zombies. Yeah, it's like oh. mutants and everything else. They have like different events. Yeah, it's it's event based. So it's like normally it's basic zombies, but like recently they had this uh, summer sideshow thing where it's like you're at a carnival, but all the carnival people are zombies. So like the uh. sirens are like bearded ladies, and uh, um, like the normal zombies are like you know walking pigs or stuff like that you know it's like they they do themed things um so people were looking forward to like christmas event you know where like all the zombies are gonna wear santa hats and like you're gonna kill elves like elf zombies um but the gameplay feels really good it feels better than killing floor one for those of you who have played it uh tripwire interactive did a lot to uh make the guns all feel good you know, like every time you wow. shoot, yeah, right. Now every time, every time you like, you know, pull the trigger, it feels like really hefty, and the sound design just, it's, you know, it just sounds so loud and like, yeah, I'm really shooting a gun. And um, so the big question is, can you sprint? Yes, is there a sprint button now? There oh is now a sprint God. button. Yes. Wow, you don't have to whip um, out and, your knife in order to run. Well, here's the thing: if you whip out your knife, you run even faster. So it's like it's still carrying uh, over that little system, but like you can still sprint as well. Um. And now whenever the big zombies spawn, like, you know, the really big, like, you know, tough ones that, you know, there are only a few of them every round toward the end. Right. Kind of like mini um, boss zombies. Yeah. Like mini boss zombies. Uh, they have this like blood curdling, like guttural, like, you know, like scream thing that they do whenever they spawn and you'll hear it and it's like loud as balls and it's just so frightening because you're in the middle of shooting all these zombies and you're just like oh and it's like oh man oh that kind of reminds me of what you're describing like uh the big daddies in the first bioshock game yeah kind of it does kind of sound like that wow um yeah so it, it it's pretty good and then at the end of every like every level i guess because you know you can play a game that's like four seven or ten waves and then at the end of that is like the big final boss who's like really tanky and you know like does a lot of damage so it's, it kind of feels like a raid boss in an fps uh-huh so you know it's the idea of like 
juggling who has the aggro and like making sure the healer is on top of healing people who need to be healed and so on. How many are on a team? Uh, six people. Okay, so six v six v p or six v six v six v e. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's six v just zombies. There is like a like a versus mode where it's like six v six and also zombies are there. Oh, interesting. Um, I didn't play that mode much, but okay. uh, each each person you can choose like a, like one of like there are ten classes to choose from. You know things mm-hmm. like you know gunslinger or like demolitionist or medic you know mm-hmm. so it's it has a lot of like class based synergy that you can come up with so like if you jump mm-hmm. in with a six man team and you're playing on like a really high difficulty you know there's like a lot of strategy involved in that if that's your thing that sounds cool so mm-hmm. well, one uh, thing about the graphical style i i would say that's kind of like the biggest barrier for me to pick up the game it just looks a little like i don't know what the word is just a little intense a little uh uh jibby <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of jibs just flying yeah. around everywhere. I mean, a lot of blood. You got to wipe off the screen. Like, I'm just like, oh, I just you, feel you can let you know about the gore physics, son. You can Ugh. turn that off, though. You can turn off the gore and the blood. But then oh, dude, I, give, it, give me all the gore. I, know, I, I was going to say, I think you know, some people would cry foul at that. Let me ask you this, though. One thing that uh, you said that intrigued me is you said the soundtrack's really awesome. Can you talk about that a yes. little bit? Yes. Okay. So it's all like heavy metal, basically. I can um, dig it. Yeah, it's it's all like really strong metal tracks um, with the occasional like, you know, softer tracks when you're, you know, like between rounds and like you're going to the trader to like buy your guns. Like you know, Doom the, level, Killer Instinct level heavy metal? Yeah, or? like that level. Um, hmm. They even because like for their, their event that they just had that summer sideshow, there's like a there's a map that's like a circus but you know, like overrun by zombies. And at that one, they have like metal tracks that are like covers of, you know, like that, 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 but like metal versions of that. So, you know, they even have like <laughs> themed songs for their event, which is pretty cool. That's so I'm awesome. getting flashbacks to the trans Siberian orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. No, it's yeah. cool. Uh, so if you're, if you're a metal head, you'll probably find a lot of good music in this and it'll feel, it'll, it just really fuels that power fantasy of like, I'm going to mow down a bunch of zombies and there's nothing they can do about it. That reminds me, since we're talking about metal, did you, uh, this is just a small tangent, but did you guys hear today the news that like Corey Taylor from Slipknot and Chad Kroger from Nickelback yes, are like feuding? It's, dude, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. I watched They're the like, whole literally Chad Kroger on Twitter. interview because like, I was like, are you serious? I couldn't believe this was happening. Wow! Do you, do you, did you hear about it? No, Robert? I just, just no, the I didn't. bare minimum yeah, information. I yeah. caught it on lunch. Yeah, so just just really quick. Um, so basically, during an interview, Chad Kroger from Nickelback was like, "Hey, so like, yeah, like, I, yeah, it's really hard to hit write a hit song." And it's and the guy's like, "Well, another band that comes to mind is like Stone Sour." And he's like, "Well, Stone Sour is basically Nickelback light." Yeah. Oh, <laughs> dude. <laughs> Nickelback light. <laughs> <laughs> never knew two words could sound like such a sick burn together that is like one of the worst <laughs> things you could ever say to anybody yeah dude well, I, anyway yeah but, oh my god but, so um yeah with killing floor 2 I'd, i recommend it to people i think it's a great it's a good game to get with friends you know they do that thing where they sell it for cheaper like if you buy it in a pack right um it's a fun thing to just do and it really scratches that that horde mode itch very well so it's something dude, to kind I- of yeah. yeah, I think it's just something to own in your library, and like whenever you feel that itch, you fire it up, and then like satisfy your hunger. Uh, Robert, it, I got a question. What's the mod scene like for that game? Um, so they have workshop content, like Steam Workshop. I don't know about the PS4 mod scene, so can't really comment on that. Um, but the Steam Workshop content, it's pretty all right. It's it's not bustling like Skyrim's, um, but it's definitely not dead like Grand Theft Auto Fives. Current uh, mod scene. Bow, 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 bow. Yeah, have you guys heard about that? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's that's some ish. Yeah, Go ahead and speak on it, Robert. Some-ish. All right, so uh, Grand Theft Auto Five publisher Take Two. Well, that sounds like they have a second publisher. Now, their publisher Take Two Interactive has uh, sent a cease and desist order to basically this piece of software that's responsible for about one hundred percent of the mods on GTA wow. Five. Wow. Um, the official reasoning is that um, apparently some people were using that software to make very like malicious like cheating mods for GTA Online, which you know that kind of makes sense, right? You know, like yeah. you don't want people to cheat in an online game. Um, yeah. But that also by causing by calling for a cease and desist, that also means there aren't single player mods. So you know you can't fly around like Superman or punch cars to death or 
I know, remember one mod that came out early on. Uh, it was like Angry Airplanes mod or something like that, where there's just like a hundred airplanes trying to crash into you at all times, <laughs> <laughs> and you're just trying to survive. It was really fun to watch. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was yeah. pretty incredible. There's some good YouTube videos on that. Yeah. So that's yeah. sad, man. So that's gonna. What happens if you already have a mod? Do you know? Does it just not gonna work? I, you're gonna have to like force push an update, and they're just never gonna work again. Well, yeah, so here's the, the reason why the um, modding scene for Grand Theft Auto has been so different is that, um, you know, like you can you can download Skyrim, for example, right? Skyrim's a huge, like I probably think the most modded game in all of history. Um, you, you can have any version of Skyrim and as long as the mod is compatible with that version, you're good, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but with GTA V, it, it's always got like constant updates and it's like always connected to the server. Yeah. Um, so you're able to check if your game is modded and they're always like consistently pushing out updates to the game to always like mess with the code a little bit. So that way mods always need to be updated like consistently. Mm-hmm. Um, so I assume if they haven't already, they've probably issued a patch to make a lot of mods uh, wow. like non usable or like they don't work with a new version. I have to imagine that the mod scene is kind of what really sparked the explosion of multiplayer. I mean, how many people think of multiplayer when they think of Grand Theft Auto? I think of like an awesome story and a really fun single player campaign when I think of Grand Theft Auto. I don't really think of, of multiplayer. I mean, I admittedly have only played maybe about 20, 30 minutes of GTA 5 online. Um, contrast yeah, that to four, hour, or four hours, 40 to 50 hours, you know, in single player. Yeah, I mean, I'm in that same boat, too, but I also know people who enjoy playing GTA Online to this day. And, like, not even with mods, it's just, you know, like, they enjoy that, the heists and, you know, being able to just yeah. GTA Online with friends, you know, just, like, yeah. go around and jack a bunch of cars. Um, so, I think there's there's still a market, and it's going pretty strong, I imagine, because, you know, Take-Two and Rockstar <laughs> are doing a lot of, like, events. It's still... Guys, I don't know if you realize this, but in uh, in the UK where they still release these numbers, because for whatever reason, America, uh, we don't get to see sales numbers for video games. But in the, I digress. In the UK, it's still in the top 10. Yes. It's like uh, it's like in the upper half, too. It's like number four, number five still. And it's like what? Like three, four, uh, four years old, four years, years old. old. I think four yeah, years old. Crazy. Still in the top it's 10. Insane. People people are buying it. People <clears> still <throat> buy consoles and just get that game. Yeah. Here in 2017. And I mean, I don't blame them. It's, it's like it's a good game. It right. feels good to play, right? Um, yeah. I mean, I imagine even online. It's like if the goals are your shtick, it's a very fun way to do it. Yes. The perception meets the reality when it comes to Grand Theft Auto V. You get a great value for your money. You know, no matter if you just want to go in and just cause mayhem, that's super fun. If you really want to stick to the story and, and get all the collectibles, like you will get your money's worth out of GTA V and you'll have a good time doing it. And that's why it's so successful. Yeah. Right. I, I, I just wanted to ask, like, so is this going to affect the modding community for GTA 4 as well? Yeah, because I think that um, that software they use, I think it's called Open 4. It was the same one that they used to mod GTA 4. Now, I can't speak to how thriving the GTA 4 mod community is since GTA 5 has been out for so long. Um, yeah, there there is um, because there was a huge community for this ENB mod for uh, GTA 4, which is called the Ice Enhancer mod which was this mm-hmm. hyper-photorealistic mod that you could use on GTA 4 that made it just look stupidly realistic. Right. Um, and so that, that had, like, a massive cult following for a while. So they, I don't know if he, the, the guy that made it is still doing updates, but he was for a good long while. Um, but, yeah, like, I so if that, like, takes that down, that would really suck because that, that dude put in an insane amount of work. And I know... Uh, there was there. I, I don't know if it was the same guy, but the, a, a new uh, ENB mod for GTA Five was also coming out that looks insane. So, right. yeah, I mean, it's just a shame to see mods being taken down like this because you know modding is such like an integral part to video game history. I think like we wouldn't have Team Fortress, you know, without modding. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have Team Fortress. We wouldn't, wouldn't have, have Daisy Rocket League. Rocket League. Um, Gary's mod, I'm pretty sure, was a mod. And then became its own it's thing. In the name. And then, yeah. And then spawned more like mods after that that then became games on their own. You know, it's like especially in the early nineties to like early thousands, modding was hu- like that's if you were made a good mod, you got a job in the video game industry. A little yeah, thing yeah. called Final, uh, Final Doom. League of Legends, maybe guys. Yeah. Yeah. Warcraft, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Um Dota yeah, it's 2. Just, 
it's insane. I mean, there's this dude um, for Skyrim, uh, Alexander or something. He made a uh, Falscar, which is this huge DLC. Like it's basically an expansion. You know, he added like wow. a whole new map and like thirty, like allegedly thirty hours of content, whole new story, whole new wow. stuff. It was basically a you know full on expansion, right? And to he did game? it all for to what game? Uh, Skyrim. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, um, and he released that, and now he works at Bungie. He was he was nineteen when he released that. That's cool. That's a cool story. Wow. I thought you'd say he works for Bethesda. No, he works at Bungie now. Interesting. Uh, at least I think. I mean, either way, like the the fact that you could do that, like that's basically your resume. You know what I mean? You'd be like, "Hi, I'm Alexander, and I made this." I mean, thirty hours of Skyrim. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So, yeah. So it's a shame to see the modding community come down like this. Um, but it also kind of makes sense. Like if you're making malicious mods for a multiplayer game where there needs to be balance, you know, like it's hard to justify that. So let's, let's move on to the big topic of our podcast. What do you Yeah, We're getting into the second hour here. We're about to turn the corner and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So, you know, I have to admit coming off of last week, I don't know what it is. I don't know what's kind of wrong with me, but I'm a little bit down on the gaming industry overall, but that's not to take anything away from what Nintendo did, how awesome Super Mario Odyssey is going to be. Like I said last week, Ubisoft has some positive things coming out, but just after looking at all the trailers and kind of digesting and having some time to think about E3, I'm just like, oh, what, what, is, what is happening? It's about to be a $500 console that I'm definitely not buying, you know, I, but again, I'm looking forward to the Switch. Not, but it's kind of important to remember that we are literally in the middle of an awesome year so far for video games. There have been some incredible games that have come out over the last 6, 12, 18 months going back basically since uh, second half of 2015. I just think we've been extremely spoiled with some awesome games coming out every month. Sometimes uh, on the weekly basis, there's like an awesome uh, either huge surprise game, indie game, triple A, you name it. But yeah, that's kind of what I want to talk about now is, you know, our kind of top three video games for 2017 so far. It being the middle of the year, I think it's a good kind of uh, time to take a snapshot at, at what we've been playing, what's really taking up our time. And so, yeah, who wants to go first? I can go first if you guys want. Okay, I'll go second after you. All right. So probably my number three game of 2017. I'm going to have to put it up to Dead Cells, that indie game. Um, uh, oh, wow. The Metroidvania style game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I put in a lot of hours into that. And actually, I heard that they uh, released a new update recently. I haven't played it yet, but I heard they added a lot of new weapons and stuff. But I remember, you know, it. I mean, this this year has been full of it. But th- that feeling of when you first play a game and you're you're hooked and that feeling you get of I'm going to be spending way more hours doing exactly this and I'm wow. more than content. You know that feeling? Yeah, I definitely know that feeling. That's kind of what I'm always hunting for when I'm playing games. That's awesome. Yeah, so I think Dead Cells definitely fits that bill pretty well if you're looking for, you know, Metroidvania style games, something very smooth and good flowing side scrolling combat. I think it's a good hidden gem of this year so far. Hmm. Um, granted, it's still early access, so not officially released yet, but what what's there is already more than enough time for but you to But they will take your money. Play. That's how early access <laughs> works. So, hey, go ahead and give us some money. I mean, You know, that's kind of what it is. It is what it is. Let me ask you, as it is an early access and you're playing it, like, can you beat it or does it just kind of like end? Does it just go to a gray screen? You can beat it. (laughs) Yeah, there's there's like a final level, Um, but they're still planning to add like more levels between like the beginning and the end. You know, so like the game will get longer, but you can still beat it. But it's it's not like a story. You know, you're not beating it for the story. It's a roguelike game. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're playing it to like keep testing your skills and be like, Oh, I wonder how this build with like this fire sword and this spell uh, like will work, you know, Mm -hmm. compared to like my previous build, which was like a blood, like a bleed based build where I kept throwing knives at people and then roll around them. You know, Uh, it's the idea of like being able to play the game differently every time, which Mm -hmm. is it's like kind of a feeling you feel with Castlevania. At least I did when I played it, but I felt like Castlevania was such a long and like you know, it was an intensive experience where it's hard to justify, like, let's go through that again, but like try to play it differently. The lighting and the pixel art stands out to me. It just looks, it has a really strong style to it. How, how's the music? The music is really good. Um, it's, it fits that kind of, uh, like 16 bit, like early PlayStation 
kind of soundtrack. Really? I, I get some like uh, Symphony of the Night. Well, not quite Symphony of the Night vibes, but it's like on that level of how good it is. I think the soundtrack, the mm. the music in it, just it's very addicting. And like you'll hear, especially the first levels music over and over again, because you're always going to die and then start at the first level again. And yeah. I'm still not sick of it. I'd imagine it's a game probably best played with a controller. Is that how you're yes. playing it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's cool. how I'm playing it with controller. Awesome, Colin. Have you played any of this game? Have you seen any of it? No, Dead Cells. No, I've seen uh, some gameplay, but like it, it definitely like appeals to me for sure. Um, I have to get around to it at some point. But it looks really awesome. I'm all for like the Metroidvania, uh, old school type games. Is so. it only on PC right now? Only on PC right now, and gotcha. I don't know if there are plans for rolling it out for consoles. Oh, there definitely will be once they get oh, enough money. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. It definitely seems like a PS4 like like PS4. Uh, it'll, I can it'll see be it on for... everything. It'll it'll be on Switch, I I yeah. would venture to guess. That's what I was going to say. I can guarantee yeah. that if it comes out on a console, the Switch will probably be a big one. Awesome. Watch watch them make a limited run like physical copy. Guarantee that's going to happen. You know, I was kind of hesitant to delve into another one. I I kind of got my Metrovania itch scratched with Axiom Verge a year, 2 years ago, and mm-hmm. so I'm just like, "Ah, do I really want to pick up one of those?" But I mean, you keep talking about it. I keep seeing things about it. Like, I don't know, maybe after 10, 15 more times hearing it, I'm just going to like buckle under the pressure and just go ahead and buy it and play because it, it looks really cool. I just wish I had the time for all these awesome games. All right. In that case, I'm going to dedicate at least five minutes every podcast from here on out to <clears> mention <throat> Dead Cells until you eventually buy it. I'll just buy it just so you don't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Perfect. that expensive. <laughs> What, okay, what is uh, it? What is it for? Like fifteen, sixteen. Uh, I think bucks? it's it's around twenty bucks. I want to say. Oh, that much. Okay. See, Maybe. it's weird that does something psych- psychologically. Like when an indie game that's not finished is twenty dollars, that's like over the line for me for some reason but if you said like sixteen dollars only four dollars i said like, oh all right maybe i mean i did get it on a sale so i got it for less than that okay cool yeah fair enough so uh let's move on jack what's your number three of the oh, first six okay, months we're gonna round robin like that okay yeah oh man so i kind of predicted this uh a month or so ago um that this is also a steam game that is in early access currently uh, it's Player Unknown's Battlegrounds is my number three game of the year so far. Oh, I and haven't heard of that. Can you tell me about it? Yeah, seriously. No, it, I mean, it's been talked about to death. It's an awesome game. It's like one of the uh, most highly played games on Steam. Also one of the most highly watched games on Twitch. Uh, you know, I don't want to get too deep into it, but it's a hundred person battle royale on a single island and you're just kind of vying all for uh, murder and that chicken dinner, that sweet, sweet chicken dinner at the end. There's only yep. one of them on the island. Only one person can have it. And uh, you've tasted the chicken dinner. The very first game you played with me, actually, we won. <laughs> yes, I did. And I haven't won a single once in my like 18 hours of playing the game. I haven't won a single one since. I know. It's so funny. The very first time you ever booted up that game, you won. And who knows if it'll ever happen again. It's, there's just too many variables. You have to get. You have to have a certain degree of luck. I really don't think you can get by on that game on skill alone. I mean, you have to get lucky. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just think it's crazy because... It's just such an uh, such a dark horse, such an unlikely kind of thing to blow up the way it has. And I, re- whenever I see someone um, playing it, or whenever I hear about it, I and start talking about it, I just instantly want to go play it. Like right now, even I'm like, oh man, I just want to get back on that island, return yeah. to the island. We got to get back. I think part of it too that's really fun. It's one of those games where you can walk out of it with a good story. You know, like I was playing it just last night, and I've already like just from playing it that night, I've got a couple like. So here's a funny thing I did in this one game. You right. know, right? It's it's a game that's very it's very organic, and it's a good sandbox for all kinds of little stories you can do. And everyone that plays it will have a different story. Mm-hmm. You know, every every story is different. Every experience, every time you you play a session, is something will happen that is just incredible and insane and just memorable and that's what's so good about that game so you know they have a long way to go they have a lot of development i know it's going to be console exclusive on xbox which is kind of crazy for at least the first year uh that's a good get um but yeah that's my number three i'm again talking about it now i just want to go back and play it yeah i kind of feel the same way right now (laughs) I really can't wait to get my PC built because I, I hear about this game endlessly and I really really want to play it you've seen it right for sure yeah yeah I, I i went to my friend's house last weekend and when i walked in he was playing it and i'm like damn everyone is playing this game and and i'm surp- as surprised as anyone else like i th- I thought long and hard because dude there are 
again, you know, uh, so many great games. Maybe we should do a real quick honorable mentions after we reveal our top three. But there's just so many great games that came out this year um, that I'm I'm just as surprised as anyone that that PUBG, what we call it for short, is is just that good, and it's not even finished yet. So, yep. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, sure. what I find funny is that, like I have a couple friends who don't have PCs. You know, they they play exclusively on consoles, and um, when they found out that Player Unknown Battleground will eventually be coming out on the Xbox, like that was the best news they heard all E3. And wow. you know, it's like that's that's kind of amazing that a game that's not even done yet can do that, right? You know. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to imagine you know a time before I played PC games. So there was a time where I was really intimidated by mouse and keyboard controls, and you know I'm still you know kind of mastering it, but uh, I can definitely put myself in their shoes. Like, oh, I can finally play this game. It's control is coming to console and controller and all that. So that's awesome. Right. Any any anything that can bring more people playing games, I'm I'm for. Mm-hmm. So Colin, let's move on to you. What's your number three? Um. So. <sighs> Here's the thing. So, like, like you guys know, I, I play a lot of, I, I play a lot of, you know, older games. So, I, it, it takes, I, I have a massive backlog. It takes me a while to catch up. Is this and a game that came out this year? Ton. What's Is that? Is this a game that came out this no, year? No, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It's, it's gonna be no, yeah. I just, I, I, I had kind of slim pickings though for game for games that I've played that have come out this year. I will say, um, but yeah, like I said, I play a lot of older games. So it takes me a while to catch up. And there's just been such a. Uh, high frequency of good games being released in the first half of this year um but for my number three game i'm gonna throw out uh persona 5 Mm -hmm. and i haven't put nearly as many hours into this game as i've i've liked to um and robert can speak a lot more on this game than i i can as of right now because he he actually beat the game i haven't i'm not even close i'm not even done with the first dungeon yet but like i've enjoyed it so much i've enjoyed it so much though like you know i mean what what can you say about Persona that hasn't been said before, right? I mean, it's it's Persona. You know, you're dungeon crawling, uh, dungeon crawling at one point, and the next thing you know, you're a kid in a Japanese kid in high school, and you're doing you know regular stuff, going to club meetings and dating girls and getting into school fights and pissing off your teachers and everything else. But anyway, yeah, I mean, Robert, you can probably talk about this a little bit more than I can. Yeah. So spoiler alert: that's my number one. Um, it'll probably be my number one at the end of the year and for the next decade. Uh, it's, Fair enough. I love that game to bits. It's so fun. Um, I think the thing that's most striking about Persona when you're not playing it is that it's still so very fun to watch. You know, like not even if you're interested in the story, but just visually, it's so very appealing. Everything's always moving. Oh, it, it really like, is. Yeah, you know, it's 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 the most visually striking game I've played, maybe ever. It's dripping mm-hmm. style, certainly, just like Persona Four did too. Yeah, right. I, I kind of I like the style of Persona Five infinitely more. I think than Persona Four, and I love Persona Four style. It's just that Persona Five, it's everything feels so sleek and modern and cool, you know. And and I mean that in every sense of those words. Um, you know, like no menu sits still, no icon is, you know, like a still figure. It's always kind of like moving in some way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. Um, the gameplay feels very like streamlined, like it's very easy to quickly, you know, get through battles, which is pretty important in turn-based RPGs like this, because you're always going to run into fights when you're dungeon crawling, um, and it never felt like a chore. I think it seems to um, me that the dungeons are a little more interesting in Persona Five as opposed to Four. Like, a, actually, a lot more interesting. Is does that hold up? Oh, yeah, it's just not you're, you're not just going down one freaking hallway that looks all the same like yeah. you are in Persona Four. Okay. Yeah, like the dungeons have gotten better every game Um, because three was just like a, you know, randomly spawning maze Uh, Four was each dungeon was themed, but they were still basically randomly created maze maze things, you know Mm -hmm. Um, But in five like each dungeon is handcrafted So granted that means there's less, you know, like replayability Um, But when you go through these dungeons, you can tell like there's always a story being told you know every step you take and every every wall you look at every decoration you see is like revealing something about that person's dungeon that you're going through and about their psyche yeah it just it captures that idea of like you're going into someone's subconscious and you're trying to find out who they are and you're trying to steal their heart to fix them oh yeah (laughs) <laughs> I it like the been, yeah. I like the mascot it, a little bit better than uh, Teddy. I hope I'm nah. not offending anybody. <laughs> yeah, good old uh, Morgana. Yeah, is Morgana a yeah, dude? But, yep, that's a weird Can't, name for a dude. Canonically, and a cat. 
Yeah, it's true. Canonically, he's a dude. That I always like, thought it was a chick. Yeah, there's a, there's a point in the story where like uh, I forget who asks you, but someone's like, I mean, what do you think Morgana is? And you get to choose like obviously uh, a boy, obviously a girl. You know, that's funny. That's funny. Yeah. One criticism I have of this game, um, and so I have gotten past the first dungeon, not much past that, but still, that's like 12, 10, 12 hours into the game. Like, I've, I've played a good fair amount to, to have a conversation about Persona 5, but the one criticism, criticism I have is <clears throat> the music. Like, I don't think, I think the music is kind of dropped down for me, at least, uh, from Persona 4. Like, there's almost no music with lyrics in it. And that was, and the mel- and the vocal melodies in Persona 4's music was some of my favorite stuff ever. Like, I can start singing it now, but it's going to be stuck in my head. <laughs> but I, lo- I, I own Persona 4's, like, soundtrack. So that was one kind of step down for me with, you know, it's fair enough to say, I think the dungeons took several, several steps up from Persona 4. Mm-hmm. Agreed. See, I think the soundtrack thing like you might need more time for it to sink in because there are a lot of tracks on the persona five soundtrack that to me are kind of earworms right now. I don't know if I'd say it's better than persona three or four soundtrack, but it's still very good. Like I'd be willing to buy the soundtrack. Yeah. It, it has the same, uh, oh, I'm going to forget his name now, but it has the same composer that uh, Shoji, it. Maguro, Shoji Maguro, I think. Thank you. Yeah. That's, I think that's Maybe. right. And, uh, yeah, I just I haven't got there yet. I'm hoping the music gets better. It's just one thing I was like, ah, uh, it just kind of sounds like he kind of mailed this one in. But I, I hope it does improve as the game goes on because the game is over 100 hours long. <laughs> yeah, it, t- yeah. T- it took me 96 hours to complete it. Wow. And you still want to go in and play, I'm sure. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, so we kind of yeah. uh, got spoiled on your number one now. We did, but that's fine. Um, yeah, I, I had a feeling me and Robert would be stepping on each other's toes a little bit. Yeah. But, hey. I mean, I don't think it was a surprise to anyone that that's my number one because I love that game. No. I, I love no. it to bits. <laughs> uh, I guess we can go to my number two for now, though. We can go in kind of backwards order for me. Yeah, we're going to have to so, recap this at the end or something to keep it straight. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm curious if I'm going to be stepping on anyone's toes with my number two. Uh, Probably will. Yeah, I'm going to go with that the one game that sold the Switch. Hmm, I wonder what that could be. Uh, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. It was really good. Uh, the tracks are pretty fun. <laughs> no, um, I'm talking about Legend of Zelda Breath of the freaking Wild. Mario Kart 8 is good, though. You mean, you mean it, it, didn't sell, it, it didn't sell you that you could play as uh, Squid Kid or whatever from Splatoon? I actually only Mario exclusively Kart? play the Inkling Girl. <laughs> er, <laughs> I, I, and that's a real thing. I'm not kidding. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah, no, Breath of the Wild. I'm curious. Is that on either of you guys' lists? Yeah, that was my number one. I mean, come on, it was uh, it was pretty. That obvious. has to be number one. Not only has Nintendo made the best Zelda game ever made, they've made one of the best video games ever made, and it's Period. shocking. Yeah, and like no joke, it it easily skyrocketed to the top of my list. Is probably the best game I've ever played in my entire life. So many mm-hmm. words. And, so, sorry, so many words have been spoken about this game, you know. But the three of us haven't really had a time to like sit down and like really digest like what exactly is going on here. There's some, there's some, there's a lot to unpack. Yeah. Uh, and there's just so much about it that makes it feel good. I think, I think the best way I could describe as to why it's such a good game is the attention to detail, like all the little things, you know, that you can find out the more you play the game, you know, like even if you're a hundred hours in, you're likely to find something to be like, oh, I didn't know you could do that, you know, or stuff like that. Yeah. It, it's all the little systems feel really good. You know, it's the idea of like, you can explore and do what you want. If you get your bow and arrow out and then you walk up to a campfire, the arrow will catch fire and you've got flaming arrows. Yeah. You know? I, I remember like, when I first uh, found that leaf, that giant leaf you can swing around. And then I found a sailboat, like a, a little raft. And I was like, huh, well this thing blows wind. What happens if I stand on the sailboat and, and swing wind at the sail? Will it work? And it totally did work. And I remember just how surprised yep. I was. And that's kind of, um, what kind of uh, blew the doors open for me to experiment and try things in that game. I was like, and sure enough, you know, when you expect something to work, it usually does. It almost always does in unexpected ways. It it is such a crazy game, such a departure from every Zelda past. I mean, it's got elements of Skyrim. It's almost like Nintendo is like, what would have been the biggest, you know, open world games 
uh, you know, in, in the industry over the last 10 years or, or no, eight, 10 years or so. And so you've got a little bit of Skyrim in there. You have a little bit of Minecraft in there. You have a little bit, you know, de- definitely a lot of Zelda in there, but it's kind of unrecognizable. And it kind of makes every other game that came previously in the Zelda series seem like a, a you know, a lightweight version of what Zelda could and should be. Yeah. I, and, um, I mean, it's one of those games where like how many times, have you played any game before this, right? We're like, oh, hey, I want to go about a situation in this game by doing this thing. But what the fuck? I can't do that one thing because the game doesn't let me. Like, whether it be invisible walls or, like, you need a key or something stupid like that. Like, Re- Resident Evil 4, like, oh, hey, why can't I jump over this gate? I obviously can jump over it, but I need a key for it. Like, right. and Zelda, in a game like Zelda you can do what like what basically whatever your mind can come up with it like as a way to solve a puzzle or go about getting somewhere you can do it that's that's the amazing thing it just gives you that that level of freedom that we've all finally been waiting for and just clawing clawing and biting at and we finally get it not to mention it's portable we can play this game anywhere for you guys like that's, yeah. that's that's, that's <laughs> the best part yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right you're on the wii u, wii u. Yeah, yeah i know hey i regret it but what am i gonna do i'm not gonna start over yeah, I mean, technically, you can play it anywhere with an outlet, if you think about yeah, it. Yeah, and a backpack to carry my console. <laughs> like, right? Can I can I can I let you guys in on a little secret about Breath of the Wild? Uh, no spoilers. I'm not that well, far into it. Well, it's not no spoilers, but I haven't beaten the final boss yet. Still, still. And I, I mean, I have like over seventy hours logged into that game. You know, it's it's one of those games where I just. You're not in any rush to do it. There's a lot more to discover, I'll bet. I'll bet there's parts of the map you might not have been to. Yeah, well, I did find every shrine, so I've been to quite a bit of the map. Okay, okay. But, you know, it's it's one of those games where I'm content with the experience I had. I don't need that, you know, you you slayed the big bad guy and saved the princess. Hurrah, like, the end. Like, I don't don't think I need that in that game. I'm going to bring back an old term. It's hobby-grade Zelda. Oh, (laughs) hobby-grade. It's like, it can be, like, your only game. Yeah. You know, that could be the one game you have and be totally happy. That, I mean, oh, just the atmosphere they nailed, the the feel, you know, it, and I'm not going to sit here and say it's like a perfect game. Like, I don't think that really exists. I mean, you know, inventory no, no. management, kind of how weak a lot of the items are, how you have to constantly be switching out weapons and shields because they're getting damaged. Like, it's kind of more a nuisance than anything else. Um, there's a lot of subsystems working underneath the surface, too, right? You have your temperature, you have sound, all those kinds of things you have to worry about. Uh, staying out of uh, thunderstorms because if you're wearing anything metal, you'll get struck by lightning. Mm-hmm. It's and stealth mechanics. Yeah, it's insane. Game. One thing I'll say, maybe you guys can speak to this on the Switch, but on the Wii U, when you get to Kakariko Village, it gets real framey for me. Yeah, well, that no, I think I think the uh, I don't know about you, Robert, but I think the the worst frame rate problems I had was when you leave the. Uh, the the temple of uh the the first temple that you know when you first wake up and uh, the temple of respite is that what it's called or whatever i don't rest know. it whatever anyway <laughs> the, the 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 first temple that you leave when you first wake up in the game and then you walk out into the grassy area and it shows like you a, like it shows like a pan view of the entire landscape right when you walk down towards the temple of time or whatever like you know the big uh chapel that's when my frame rate took the hardest hit, personally. For me, it's like, the Korok Village, I think. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, actually, you know what? Where you get the Master Sword at? Ridiculous. Like, the frame rate is so god-awful. They should have just duct really taped is. one more Wii U together. Instead of two, make it three, right? And we wouldn't yeah. have this problem. <laughs> I, I agree. I mean, they did come out with a patch like a couple weeks after the game. Um, came out where it improved a lot of the frame rate issues, and I feel like I did notice a uh, significant improvement over um, just kind of like running around in grassy wildlands. You know, there were just like less framey times, so it's yeah. somewhat improved. Um, you know, I think come year end, and you know, all the major publications and critics come out with their top ten of the year. I fully expect this to probably be the most rewarded game of the entire year. Um, who knows what might come out during the holiday season? There, there will definitely be some surprises, but I just can't believe a game is going to be more celebrated and more critically lauded than Zelda Breath of the Wild. It just did something that I personally did not think Nintendo had in them to just completely 
you know, wipe the slate clean with what Zelda has come to be and just completely reinvent it in a way that makes sense, that is relevant, but, you know, borrows from certain mechanics and games, but also presents it in a fresh new way that is challenging and like compelling. I don't know. There's, I don't know how many, <laughs> like hyper, how much hyperbole I can hurl at this game, but it's, it's just something special. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be remembered. Like it's going to go down in history. It's one of the best Zelda games. I don't know how they're going to do a sequel to it. Yeah, that's that. That was my next thing. I was like, "How the hell are they going to follow up something like Breath of the Wild or Super Mario Odyssey, for that matter? Like, how are they going to follow these? Like, how are they going to follow these games up?" The, the track record is bad. Okay, let's just revisit this a little bit. For when Nintendo comes out with something revolutionary, the very next um, installment in the series is typically not so good. So, Metroid Prime, Metroid Prime Echoes, um, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask. Uh, Are you telling me you don't like Majora's Mask? Yes, and we're going to fight about it, too. And so, oh, no. hold on, I'm not even done with the bad sequels on Nintendo, okay? And then also you have uh, Mario 64, Mario Sunshine. Oh, uh-huh, so there there's just there's just really bad... I mean, come on, guys. I know you personally like them, but they're not like... So I, so Robert's mad about Mario Sunshine. <laughs> Colin's staring I, at me I about know. Majora's Mask. <laughs> Remember, I never played Mario Sunshine. Oh, so okay. I I, oh, I thought you were an ardent defender of Mario Sunshine. Oh, no, no. My mistake. My mistake. So I'm just saying, Nintendo has a track record, right? When they come out with something revolutionary for the industry, they kind of fall flat um, in following it up. So what I'm really trying to say is, enjoy the shit out of Breath of the Wild. <laughs> Because it's going to go downhill and it's going to go downhill with the next installment. I hope it's like three, four years, uh, you know, in the future because no one's rushing, you know, to to uh, get off this game. This game's awesome. And mm-hmm. we can have this debate about Majora's Mask another day. <laughs> yeah, I, I think. No, I'd like I would I would just say, like, if if we got a sequel to Breath of the Wild that was like its darker counterpart, like Majora's Mask was to Ocarina of Time. And they somehow did it in like a darker fashion. They like I don't know. They like Twilight Princess, like Breath of the Wild. I wouldn't be mad about that. Like I would play the shit out of it. I mean, Twilight Princess is my favorite Zelda game for nostalgia reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I don't know. I, I I definitely liked the darker tone of Twilight Princess enough that like if they did something like that to a Breath of the Wild sequel, I wouldn't be mad, and I would totally play the shit out of it. I mean, give me another open world Zelda game with those gameplay mechanics. I'm gonna play it for sure. It's a it's such an interesting problem they have when you examine it, and I think we're kind of premature in these conversations. But when Nintendo does, you know, consider a follow up to Zelda. It might not even come out. I I honestly think they're smart if they wait till the next console launches, and that's when they the, do the next Zelda. The Switch U. Yeah, the Switch U. <laughs> yeah. The Switch. U. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like it'll be. It should be. The, I'm, the I'm serious though. I think they should like milk this game for as much as they can. It's it's gonna be. I, Nintendo games keep their value, but I can imagine this game being a little bit cheaper around holiday season, at least for Black Friday. Yeah, yeah it's honestly, so good. it's worth buying now. It's worth double the money. Seriously, it's a sixty dollars game. It's worth double that. Like I think the Nintendo Switch Blade. I think I'd almost rather instead of like Breath of the Wild two or like a new Zelda game, like another big expansion pass, like one that actually yeah. adds like a lot of content. N- to yeah, this game. I bought the first one. I'm um, looking forward to that. But yeah, I, I definitely would love to see them you know add on to it uh continuously it's it's just that kind of game add add like a new like island or a new you know yeah. uh under underworld or something like that like just give me more reasons to log more hours into that game basically for sure for sure and so i don't know did i already mention this like where this game falls on my list uh did you say number one I think you yeah did. yeah i did okay so okay. if we're good so- to roll on to the my number two i guess since we're going in yeah. this crazy weird fibonacci number sequence of top three <laughs> Um, well, unless yeah, you guys have anything else to say about Zelda, no. So my number two, guys, near Automata. Okay, I'm excited because I, I was hoping I'm, that we'd I'm talk so, about that platinum. I'm games. so jealous that I, I haven't like I haven't played that yet, and I really, really am oh, dying man. to play that it, game. It is okay. It's definitely rough around the edges. Um, you know, it, it definitely is lacking in some polish. Um, it's not a perfect game, but it's such a great game. The art style, the graphical just the landscapes the atmosphere the music is incredible i am so shocked near on ps3 okay and then now the sequel near automata 
on PC and, and console. Oh my gosh, probably the best uh, music in games. Seriously, guys, I'm telling you, of that whole generation, PlayStation 3, near best soundtrack. And and this game right now, I love the music. I love the character design. I think the fighting is super cool. The weapons, I, I will say though, the, the fighting gets a little, ah, monotonous isn't really the word, but it's just a little easy. You know, you might want to, if you really want challenging gameplay, if you want something on the level of Bayonetta, it's not quite there. And I think that's kind of like, have you tried higher difficulties or like even at the max? I have, one, pretty I, have I have. And um, it's just not as it, the, the combat looks so good and it feels really good, but it's just not as deep, you know, like technique wise as you would require in something again, like a Bayonetta or some of the best like action games out there. It's not quite there. But again, the story the the world around it uh just the incredible incredible um design overall has just been is just such a great experience and there's nothing i can think of that's really like it um out there so it's just incredibly unique it's i mean what what can else can be said about it it's just something i'm i'm gonna remember it's one of those experiences that i'm gonna like think back years back and think fondly at the time i spent with it um there's like what like 26 different endings like one for every letter of the alphabet like it gets ridiculous you know i don't want i'm not gonna spoil the game but if it's something that's on your radar definitely definitely uh should be something you play this year yeah i i've been keeping an eye on it um i want to pick it up when it's a little bit cheaper fair enough it it's definitely got my attention it's it's got that weird anime vibe to it that i think would really like it's right up my alley I think so. I, I feel like I might may have said this to you guys previously, but I rarely buy $60 games, but this was one game that I really wanted to reward the developers for making and for actually getting made because there's no reason in the world that this game should be developed and released because Nier was not a commercial success. It grew into cult uh, favorite status, but there's no real reason, you know, uh, from a commercial standpoint that they should have made a sequel to it. So I'm so grateful for that, that I was like, you know what, here's 60 bucks plus tax. Like I want you guys to have it because I'm so grateful that this thing exists and it's a thing. So that was another example of me voting with my dollars. Certainly. So what, like if I were to buy the game, how many hours ish would you estimate that I'd be able to get out of it? Oh, how long is it is what you're saying? Well, because I, I know the game is like fairly short to beat, but there's like a lot of replay value. Yeah, remember, well, right? well, you don't really get the true ending the first time you beat it. Okay. Okay. So it's it's part like I don't want to spoil it too much, but it's and I haven't gotten all 26 endings far from it. But from my understanding, like to get the real full story, you have to go through what is considered the 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 end boss, quote unquote. Right. You have to beat him like four or five times which is doesn't mean you have to play the whole game four or five times because when you do it when you do beat it and you do a playthrough the game knows you're doing a second playthrough and it changes and it's it's not like it's not like a game plus it's almost like a weird linear progression and and it's just such a strange esoteric story like it's really hard to describe unless you like see it or unless you like experience it so kind of groundhog's day vibes kind of uh sort of but again like the second time you play through it it's not going to be the same as the first at all it's it's gonna be way shorter for one it's gonna be way more uh contracted and yeah I, that's all i really want to say other than okay. you know it, it really should you really should play it through you know to at least the fourth or fifth ending to get the full story and that whole process i would say maybe takes 40 hours wow yeah okay it's awesome, guys. It's it's an experience. I mean, it just reminds me of if you took, uh, I don't know, like in a way, it reminds me of like Gunstar Heroes and and uh, Sin and Punishment. Some of those old treasure games, how the combat felt so good, like on Genesis and on Nintendo sixty four. I, I I feel like they took a lot of those sensibilities and turned it into a three D semi open world character based action game and. That's all you got to say to me to hook me in, man. So mm-hmm. it, yeah, the comic does remind me yeah, of treasure. I'm already, I'm already sold. I'm already sold on the game, dude. For real, yeah. like it, everything about it, the gameplay is just. I played the demo and I'm like sold. This just this mm-hmm. is amazing. And oh, I, can't, uh, I just want to tell you guys so much, but the gameplay just varies so much. I mean, there's like he- bullet hell shooter elements to it. There's just uh, crazy scenes where the camera will just totally shift your view and actually that i have an ultra wide screen right at 21 by 9 like it really scales to that perfectly 
so I can actually see more to the left and the right in the world and it really works to my advantage. Oh man. I, That's it, cool. It, it doesn't run great like on PC. It runs well, but it's it's not you know going up to 100 frames a second or whatever. It's, it, but it's definitely is better on PC than on console. If you, if you have a, a decent um, graphics card, I'd definitely recommend the PC version. Yeah, I think the the one thing that really sold me on the game, aside from like the aesthetic and the combat, is the idea of how you can kind of tweak your because like you play as an android, right? And I remember when I played the demo, you could tweak like whether you could see your health bar. Or whether you could see like enemies' health bars yeah, and stuff like that. It, yeah, they have this weird chip system, so you're kind of leveling up like how like your motherboard or whatever it is, like how how many skills you can equip, and then yeah, it'll it'll change like HUD elements and change like what you see when you do this particular activity, like, and you know how much health you have, all kinds of different things. But it changes the game in ways that other games you know haven't in the past. It's really really interesting system, and it gets deeper yeah. the more you get into it. Breaking down barriers, man. That's what we need. It, it's a fresh game. It is totally fresh, and it deserves to um, be experienced. I'm worried it's going to kind of fall under the radar under the deluge of such awesome games coming out this year. But so far, what are we? June 2017. It's my number two game of the year so far, certainly. Very nice. Uh, Colin, what's your number two game of 2016, 2017? So, right, so far. So. I think this is our last one, isn't it? It's our last yeah, one. it's the last one we were. Yeah, because and then we have to recap because yeah. I don't know where. <laughs> yeah, you, you guys like Blades of Steel on Nintendo? Is that your top three? <laughs> yeah, Blades of Steel. <laughs> okay, no go ahead. Um, so my my number two, and I've I I already couldn't shut up about the game before, but Yakuza Zero. Mm. So yeah, uh, Yakuza it's in Zero, your top man. Three. Sweet. Yeah, no no joke though, like. So uh, the the gameplay itself is, uh, you know, the, like I said before, you're just going around basically getting in fights and kicking everybody's asses, le- learning different fight styles. So, like, the more I play, the more this game just, like, impresses me, man. Like, I haven't been it yet, but, like, the the story is, like, has so many twists and turns. And, like, turns out you actually play as another, uh, there's another protagonist that you play as. Uh, his name is Majima. And he's the dude that runs this huge like nightclub uh over in uh, osaka and so like you're this dude basically you're managing this nightclub and uh basically you had to go around and keep your employees on track like oh this guy's zoning out why is he zoning out like oh well like turns out my dad's in the hospital I'm like oh well don't worry about it take like two million yen or whatever you need <laughs> or uh yeah yen and just like go pay your your dad's medical bills you're fine and like you're just doing like all this manager stuff and you feel like super badass and uh like it when people like come in and start trying to wreck your place you're like you just go down and just wreck them uh and like you basically find out why he's like running the nightclub the way he does and you find out his but like it, that's the thing dude there's like there's so many cool story on smith's game i just like if you guys ever decide to play it i don't want to spoil it because there's just like so many things where i was just like wow Colin. like this what? Every time you talk about your experiences in this game, I feel like you're off your meds. <laughs> like, it's like <laughs> the craziest story. It's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Every time you talk about it, because you've been talking about it pretty regularly. I know. I know. I, like, I've talked about it, I think, every episode so far. But, like, this this game is just, it's I, it's one of those games where, like, I saw a little bit of gameplay of it. I think I saw, like, Angry Joe's review of it on YouTube. Shout out. Um and like he's like well you know this game has this and that flaw and blah 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 but then he's like but let me tell you why it's one of the best games i've ever played and then he like goes off and talks about like all the crazy mini games he shows off some of the uh you know the combat and all that stuff and i was like wow i need to play this game and like even then like i wasn't going with like crazy high expectations but like the story like more than anything has just blown me away like just the way the the writing is is one of those things where like wow like someone came up with that like writing wise like this story is just there's so many layers to it and it's just it just never fails to impress me the gameplay itself like it's it's good the um and it keeps it stays fresh enough to never really quite get repetitive but you just you do do a lot of fighting which i mean depending on who you are i don't mind it because it's like you're walking down the street and maybe you get kind of bored because you're just kind of roaming around looking for what to do next in your quest or whatever but then like oh these bikers or hooligans show up and you're like okay let's go and you do just like puffs up his shoulders and he's like and cracks his neck and he's like let's do this and you just like beat the shit out of these guys and they're like oh super must say i didn't mean to like come on to you and fight I was you. Waiting like, for the voice they just like apologize yeah, everyone's to you. got yeah, a yeah. jersey yeah. accent <laughs> yeah like I don't, dude it's all in japanese man it's all he adds his own i don't know <laughs> 
<laughs> you gotta get, you gotta, you gotta give them something, right? Um, they all sound like hooligans. This game is definitely um, adding visibility to the whole series. I heard they recently um, republished yeah. all, all the games in the series in America. Yeah, the, which is great because, like, yeah, it, and because of that, uh, because of Yakuza Zero, it has got gained a lot of notoriety. It had like a cult following before, but it's just kind of blowing up now. I don't know what exactly they're doing different. I, I don't know if it's just because they've they haven't even really marketed it. I, I don't know. It's maybe because there's so many so much media behind it that the other games didn't get before. Um, there, there's so much hype behind it, especially since they're like kind of like it's like the start of the series, so it's an easy jumping in point. That could be why, especially with them remaking the uh, first game as well, coming out in August. Um, but yeah, like you said, they are like they've been doing reprints of Yakuza 2 for the PS2, which has been a pretty hard to find game if you're a collector. Yeah. Um, and so like t- prices are going down with that. Just they're just making a push to make this series more accessible. And like soon after that, we have uh, Yakuza six coming out, I think next year for over here in the U S but I'm not entirely sure on that, man. It looks cool. And I'm definitely getting word of mouth from so many different channels that I'm just like, man, like I wish I had time. Right. (laughs) That's the whole problem. Right. Yeah. I feel like that's the theme of this year, isn't it? I wish I had more time. Seriously. Right. And, but that's what, that's what I like about this game. Cause so like, I don't. I don't really nece- necessarily like games that tarry too much between plot points, especially since this game has like such a dense and awesome story. So like, and that's what I like about this game. It, it lets you wander when you want to wander, but it keeps the story moving when you want it to move. So it just like it just keeps like snapping to each story point, which is what you want to get to, which is awesome. I, I really appreciate when games do that. Unlike, uh, I don't know what's a bad example like. I don't know, Dream Drop Distance. I thought Dream Drop Distance, like Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance, tarry, tarry, it tarries a lot between plot points. And it's like, dude, like I love the gameplay in Kingdom Hearts, don't get me wrong, but I, re- I care a lot about the story in Kingdom Hearts. So it's you're kind of giving me like just little nibbles and bits up until the very end. Gotcha. So there's a so, story in Kingdom Hearts. Right. It's a very Who complicated knew? one <laughs> that is not worth it. Okay. Ansem is not really Ansem, but Ansem really is Ansem, oh. and then Ansem is Ansem? I just can't yeah. be bothered to give a crap. <laughs> it's impossible to recap. Just let me hang out with Goopy, Goofy, Goopy. <laughs> Goopy. <laughs> Goopy <laughs> and Donald. Let me Goopy. hang out with Goopy and Donald. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Dolan yeah. is like the meme version. <laughs> no, but just give me my Disney and let me swing this Keyblade. And give me some, you know, give me some coins and some hearts and call it a day. That's how I feel. It's about money. Hearts. It's money, I don't not know. coins. With a U. Yeah. Give me some. Give Dude, me some rings. Honestly, Can I have some rings and some <laughs> Zenny. <laughs> Bring Zenny back. Some Zenny. Is this is this Dragon Ball Z now? Oh man. <laughs> So yeah, so, so no, yeah. like honestly, I'm at the point now where you can just take all of Disney out of Kingdom Hearts, and I would still play it. But anyway, I digress. Let's recap I don't know real about quick. that. Let, but yeah, let's yeah, recap. Let's, let's move on here. We've been uh, yeah. on this a lot. Let's, so let's recap. So Robert, you went first. Recap for the people your top three games of 2017 so far. Yes, and I think we can also add honorable mentions in our recap. I think that'd be a fair thing because I'm sure there are enough games out there. Um, so my number three is Dead Cells, that uh, early access game on PC. Uh, my number two, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, the Nintendo Switch system seller. And my number one, of course, is Persona 5, published by Atlas. Awesome. Let's let's hold off yeah. on um, honorable mentions till the end. We'll all do it together. How about that? Okay, fair okay. enough. So, all right, I'll go second. Um, just to recap again, my number three game so far of 2017 is Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Um, number two, Near Automata, or Automata, however you want to say it. And then number one, Automata. Zelda Breath of the Wild. Number one game, maybe of this decade, but we'll see. We got three more years. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, my top three games of 2017 so far. Uh, number three, Persona 5. Uh, number two, Yakuza 0. And number one, no surprise, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Awesome. One of the greatest games I may have ever played, ever. Awesome. One of the most hardest to follow up games ever released. <laughs> it's a seminal <laughs> release. I mean, it's going to be, it's, oh my gosh, I just can't say enough good things about it. I, and who knows, like, if anyone's listening now that hasn't played or at least heard of it, I mean, it's ubiquitous. You know, if you're into video games, you know about that. So yeah. uh, honorable mentions. I ha- so I was gonna honorable mention your like number one game, like it's Persona Five, <laughs> but like we already gave it enough honor and enough mentions. So I think the big big standout here so far, at least for me, is uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. 
that game was so close to coming up uh, to my uh, top two, uh, number two or number one even. I mean, it, there is an argument to be made. It is that good. I cannot express to you guys enough. Have you played it, either of you? No. No, it's it's oh, it's way up man, there on my to buy list along with uh Nier and uh Neo. It, right it's now. one of those games that you get that feeling like this is gonna be my game. I'm gonna p- sit down, I'm gonna play this like eight hours a day, I'm gonna experience it. It is such a masterpiece, and I don't use that word lightly. It is a fantastic game. It's a shame that it couldn't get on the top three. I just think that the top three games that I selected, like, have just done more and 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 uh yeah, I just, I, oh, it really pains me that it's not on there. But man, it is such a game deserving of all the accolades it's getting. Can Gotta I ask you a question it. about Horizon Zero Dawn? I'll try and answer it. Okay, so like, there is a story. I assume. Have you beaten oh, it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, so is it one of those games where, like Legend of Zelda, like even if you did beat the story, there's like so much fun random crap to do, or is it kind of one of those? I've beaten the story. I'm done. It's yeah. You would have more to do. There's a lot okay. to it. it's and it's not just like a Far Cry kind of thing either where you just it's so it's so much more refined than Far Cry three or Far Cry four, you know, where it's not like you're doing the same like tower like nineteen times. You're more so like doing the tower like four times in the whole game, mm-hmm. right? But they're just like the four awesomest towers you've ever climbed in your life kind of thing. Okay, right. so the quality's amped up, then the quantity's turned down. Um, but it still uh, spans over the course of a whole game. So I don't want to say too much about it, but other than like, seriously, guys, this year, do not let that one slip through. I'm, I just feel like it's in danger. Um, it's such a great game. The graphics too take PS4 on to another level. I mean, probably some of the best graphics, if not the best graphics on that system, period. And they run and it runs great on a regular PS4. A PS4 mm. amateur, mm. it works great on it, and the PS4 Not Pro, the Pro. PS4 yeah. amateur, yeah. <laughs> and it, yo, know, seriously, it looks great, it looks fantastic. Um, gotta play it. So that's my number one honorable mention. You guys want to chime in? Yeah, I definitely want to see it running on my beautifully on my PS4 Pro for sure. Um, but yeah, like I said, I um, honorable mentions. Like I, I did. Uh, pre- preface my my top three with saying that I haven't played a whole lot of games from this year quite yet but i will say that like like i said before horizon neo near they're like at the top of my to buy list coming up here i'm just kind of waiting on that sweet spot for them to drop in price right now um but i don't really have any audible mentions as as far as games that i've played uh otherwise from the three i listed uh from 2017 Hmm. um i'd like to throw a shout out to tekken 7 actually oh word yeah yeah, it's it's pretty recent release, so it might be a little premature to say, but of the like twenty plus hours I've played, I I mean it's definitely a hobby grade game for sure. Um, but it's it's so fun, and I it's been a long time since I played a fighting game, but this might be the first fighting game I played where, that made me want to buy a fight stick. You know, nice, nice. Um, do it. Yeah, I, I can do um, this behavior. Yeah, you won't regret it. Mm-hmm. It's it's a fun game. I think if if you're even remotely interested in fighting games, Tekken Seven is a great place to start. Um, they don't have a good tutorial, but it's a they've got a good system where you can just like play around and like get a feel for all the characters that you're interested in playing as. And the games feel very you know it's like it's purely a fighting game. There isn't some like you know long cutscenes building up to a fight or something. It's just you load in, you fight round one, round two, round three, you're done. You know, it's just a, such a pure fighting game experience, and I think it might be the best fighting game to come out this year so far. It so adds, I'd really recommend. It adds uh, certain things to just the fighting genre overall. I love when fights get really close towards the end, and the, the final blow is really like dramatized. Like time slows down, the camera zooms in. You don't really know exactly who's going to win, but whoever lands that next hit is the winner. And just the way it happens, so dramatic and really cool. Really, uh, yeah, really awesome and original way to kind of end a match and make it more exciting, right? And it's not always the final blow, too. It's usually it usually happens when there's like an input that happens around the same time where it's like both hits are going to land pretty close to each other. Sweet. And what's what's cool is like at that point, there's nothing you can do. You know, your character's in the middle of his or her animation, so you know it it still feels fair and balanced, but it just adds that extra style of flair that gets you really excited. Like um, last week, I had a couple friends over, and I, like none of them are fighting game people, but I was like, "Hey, you guys want to like fire up Tekken and just like 
you know play around and you know after a couple matches a lot of those like slow motion like who's gonna get hit who's gonna win the fight like you know those those scenes really generated a lot of excitement with people these people who've never played a fighting game in their life and i think awesome. that's really cool awesome yeah it's one of those games where even if you're not a fighting game pro or anything like that you can kind of you know have friends over a couple beers and just kind of mash on the buttons and still have fun and it looks yeah. so good. The game looks great. And it, Akuma, yeah. like I heard, was handled really well. I haven't played the game personally myself, but I heard that the Street Fighter character that's in the game, like his, you know, is is not a train wreck, which is kind of a surprise. It actually works really well. So I, you know, I would like to see more uh, Street Fighter uh, in Tekken. I'm I'm for that. Yeah, I mean, I haven't played Street Fighter enough, I guess, to vouch for how well Akuma translates. Um, but you'll definitely be playing him a lot. He's he's surprisingly pretty integral to the story, which I found interesting. You know, for them to make a character who comes outside of the lore to be such an important part of the story. I won't say how, but it's pretty cool. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's it for my honorable mentions. Anyone else have any more for the year? No, that was it for me. It kind of just hurts my brain to think about all the awesome games coming out, and it just makes me depressed to think about all the ones I'm missing now too. Like, oh. Yeah, same here. If only I had more <laughs> time. So I think that should uh, lead us into the final segment of our show. Jack, do you want to take this one away? Yeah, so we're going to start a new segment here every week. Uh, and feel free to contribute, too, as well. Um, you know, if you have your own, I should, I guess I should say what it is. <laughs> we're going to do, uh, at the end of the episode, we're going to start doing a Would You Rather, where it's kind of a moral quandary that I uh, place into the podcast, and we'll see what kind of discussion happens around it. Also, you know, if... Uh, you want to throw us your own would you rather questions we're definitely open to them our email address is tiny podcast at gmail or tiny, tiny disc sorry, tiny disc podcast at gmail.com and also um what's our twitter handle colin uh twitter handle you can find us on twitter at tiny disc podcast all right so yeah so those are a couple channels where you can reach us with your own would you rather we'd love to receive them and answer them here for you on the air as well so the first would you rather i was kind of looking online for some good ones but then i was like you know what i I can make up my own so i literally thought of this right before the podcast and i'm really curious to hear what your guys thoughts are what are you gonna say and I'd, i'd like to preface Neither Colin and I know what's about to come out of Jack's mouth. No. So I am not responsible yeah. for whatever he says. Okay. No, it's fine. <laughs> prepare, no. The, prepare the for the live There's some reacts. really dirty ones online. I was like, I'm not going to use those. I can come up with something smarter and, and would have a better conversation. So, okay. Would you rather keep your cell phone? You'll have a cell phone for the rest of your life, but you'll have half your intelligence. Or would you rather give up your cell phone and have twice the intelligence. And again, when I say keep your cell phone, I mean for the rest of your life. And give up your cell phone for the rest of your life. So, question. Let's say I give up my Samsung Galaxy S7 for twice the intelligence. Can I then the next day go out and buy a Samsung Galaxy S8? You can never own a cell phone again for the rest of your life, but you'll be twice as intelligent as you are right now today. Or you'll Wait, lose one or more you'll question. lose half your intelligence and you'll have a cell phone for the rest of your life. All right. Question. So are we talking smartphone or can we still have like a regular cell phone to communicate Zero with? mobile devices. Switch? What about Nintendo Switch? You can play can video games. You can play video games, yeah. A tablet. Zero. No. Nothing that can connect to the internet with a screen. So the switch, the internet functionality would be off. But what if I what if my tire blows out and I have to call AAA? <laughs> exactly, like exactly. Payphones. Pay phones. <laughs> yeah, this is what you rather. So again, guys, would right. you rather uh, have a cell phone? Laptops. Other... Do laptop computers? Like, are you able to have a laptop? Yeah. 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 Okay. Didn't say nothing about laptops. Mm. I'm, I'm trying to think of loopholes here. I know you um, guys are trying to game the system. No, but this is you yeah. know get down to the meat of it. The reality is now <laughs> you're either twice as smart or or you're half as as smart. <laughs> Twice as smart or half as dumb. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait, half as dumb. <laughs> I didn't say that. You said that. <laughs> you were about to, though. <laughs> you guys are smart. I, I, <laughs> um, dude, I don't know. Like, okay. I think I know. So here's the thing. I know what I'd go with. Here's the thing. So if you have half your intelligence, but you still have a cell phone, the thing is you can look up anything and everything on that cell phone. So 
at the same time, you can access any inf- information you could possibly need in said cell phone. As long as you have a cell signal now, and battery life, but then you have to go and walk around being dumb all the time. <laughs> yeah, so, like, we're talking about how, like, half of our current intelligence, right? Just, like, as we sit Today, right now, yeah. cut that in half. Exactly. Well, I don't know, like, I don't know exactly how dumb I would be <laughs> if you did that. <laughs> like, no, see, that's a fair point. That is a fair point. Like, how, you'd be how half dumb. as dumb. Your vocabulary, half your vocabulary dumb, would be in half. Your musical talent would be in half. Your mental faculties are cut by 50% across the board. Uh, okay. Um, you'd be half as funny as okay, you are. So, you know what I mean? So, okay, but if I doubled how I, how I sit now, I mean, I would be pretty damn smart. I don't know at, to what level exactly. I don't know. Should we test it? Like, maybe we should we should have taken, like, IQ tests or something stupid like that. You know, we'll we save that this. for an episode of the future. I think that'd be really interesting if we all took one and then just share the results. Oh, my God. The pressure I would, would be I, on I publicly. You want to state your IQ score? I totally score? would have the lowest number. Come on now. <laughs> all right. I, um, now I see the gears spinning, guys. I'm kind of interested. So, I mean, so I, you have okay, the sure. you're still You're still rallying around. Yeah, so I honestly, I, I think at the end of the day, I think because I've always part like part of me has always strongly felt that my cell phone has been a hindrance to me um, and that it's just such a big distraction um, that it's it's affected me in ways like that. I, I don't think I, I think as deeply as I, I should or something like that or that I um, I could improve my interpersonal communication without it. Uh, you know, basic things like that. Um, I, I, I think it, emergencies aside from when you need absolutely have to contact someone, I think I would throw aside my cell phone to up my intelligence. Don't you get that stress, though, when you don't know where your cell phone is or when you don't have control over it, you leave it at home? Of course I do. Well, okay, but of course part, I do. part of that stress is that I own a cell phone, but where is my cell phone? Whereas if you don't own the cell phone, you're not as stressed about like, oh, I don't. Where's right, my phone? Oh, I don't know one anyway. Well, I'm just going to go about my day. Now, here's a question I have. Are landlines allowed? Yeah, like an actual I mean, physical landline. Like you own a- in your home? Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. saying phones are gone. I'm saying your cell phone's gone. Okay. I'd easily go with the double the intelligence because guess what? If if I were twice as smart as I am now, I'd come up with something. I'd, I'd figure out a way. <laughs> There's to no, give, okay. I can't. Right. Okay. I just make like, like, some shit out of a toothpick and a paper clip and some listen, gum. That argument is null and void. Okay. There's no working around this. Okay. You're not going to be able to communicate with a touch device that fits in your pocket for the rest of your days. Look, all you I'm saying is. You can't develop it. The, the reason why we can't develop it is we're half as smart as we could be. You're copping out, Robin. You're robbing, <laughs> you're robbing us a good debate here by doing this. No, I think if I were twice as smart, I'd be able to come up with a different way to be able to communicate with people. Not not through smartphones. <laughs> Fucking smoke Smel- Smell phones. <laughs> smell phones. <laughs> Tele- Got it. Telepathically. Yeah. No, yeah, see, cell phone's a better I, idea, though. See, I, like I was cur- I think the, the virtuous answer is, say, oh, I'd much rather give over my cell phone. But I think in reality, I think it's just a lot harder than we might be making it out to be. I mean, imagine like how much you're going to miss. Okay. You're, you're going to basically social media, you know, when, unless you are just literally at home all day long on your laptop, like you're not going to, you know, be in touch with your family. Let's say you do get a flat tire. You're not going to be able to order Uber eats. Uber doesn't exist for you. You're gonna have to depend on other people. It affects a shitload of your life and it will affect it for the rest of your life. Every second of every day that you're not around a Wi-Fi or a laptop. I just think it's, I just think it's a bigger deal, you know, to not have a cell phone, which just speaks to like how, dependent everyone is on it's a harder decision for me to think of you know but i don't know what do you guys think yeah. you're not I mean, worried about it you seem thing. to be brushing it off robert well i'm brushing it off because i have faith in myself if i were <laughs> twice as smart like here's the th- like look at the end of the day i do think that cell phones are kind of a hindrance sometimes right um but they're also still pretty integral i you know it's like a tough decision to make and say right now but i feel like you'd still be able to get by with like landlines laptops you know basically be i mean be we, 60 year old for the rest of your life right i mean we existed for you know the the past few centuries without say like i mean even the past like 20 years without stuff i mean 20 years before this we existed without cell phones just fine is what i was getting at so i don't know so here's the thing though if i was half as smart 
as I, as I am now. Where's this going? But I still had my cell phone. Like, I wouldn't be sitting where I am right now. That's the thing. <laughs> We're not really thinking about, like, I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't have made big life decisions like going to, like, high, like, you know, I probably would have dropped out of high school. I probably wouldn't have gotten a higher education or any of that. Yo, you, you may know. not even know how to drive. No, but look, it would have that, happened I don't know today. How, you already how, would have accomplished all that. It, this happens. To, this is effective today, not retroactively. Oh, this is today. Well, then I would certainly fail. Like, out of, like I wouldn't be, <laughs> like, I would fail out of my senior year <laughs> coming up here. Like, you need those brain cells. Like, I wouldn't. <laughs> you need all of them. Oh, I, I, would, I do. Hear you. And I don't know. I probably wouldn't be able to play video games as well as I do. Not not that I play very video games very well anyway, but like, you know, things like that. So I don't know. I don't know to, I still don't understand to like what extent half of my intelligence would be, but like, I, I definitely think it would, it would affect us more than we're letting on. So that's what I'm saying. So I think I would much rather go with double my intelligence. Yeah, that's that's why. Just throw away the cell that's phone. part of the reason I think my argument is kind of valid. Because if you're a dumb boy, it doesn't matter if you have a cell phone. You don't really know how to use it to get what you need. What if you, you know? It's gonna be harder. For, it's gonna be harder for you to make the connection of like, like a very base connection. Like, oh, my car broke down. Let's call AAA. Like that's a very duh thing to us right now. But like, imagine if you were you were like actually mentally handicapped. Like it might not be that. Like you may have a cell phone, but you're like. <laughs> I don't know. You just Google car dead and, you know, like you don't know what to do. <laughs> car Dude, dead. People yeah. do that right <laughs> today. People are that what dumb. do? <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's the thing. It's like if you're half as intelligent as you are now, that's not good. But if you're twice as intelligent as you are now, you'll fi- you'll be able to figure out ways to work around not having a phone. You're smart enough to do Your that. Your car wouldn't and break I don't mean, down, you know? You would yeah, stave I don't, it I off. Yeah, I don't mean the... I don't mean the joke I was making of like, I'll make the, the smartphone 2.0 that's even newer and better, but like, you know, you'll be able to plan things ahead of time because you'll have better, like, you know, management skills, better planning skills, and you'll have a lot of like backup plans for, cause like, I assume I'd be the only one in the world, right? Who's like twice as smart, but can't have a phone. Yeah. So I'd know that I'm inherently limited by, by, you know, just the fact that everyone else owns a smartphone, but I don't. So... I could it's like I'll figure out a way to do it, and also I can just make friends and ask to use their phone if I really need it. I hear you. I'm just thinking. I- yeah. See, that was that was my next point. I'm sorry, Jack. No, I cut you off, bud. Uh, um. Anyway, so like that was my other point. I was like, so if I'm double, like double as intelligent as I am now, I'm gonna obviously find some way to be like really innovative or do something that makes me rich. I'm gonna do something that that gets me in a position where I can have other people or maybe some sort of assistant that has a cell phone that can make these calls for me. I don't but have then to you're gonna be that guy. <laughs> Dude, you're going to be that guy though in your social circle. Like fuck Collins here at the party. He's going to be asking everybody to check like Twitter or some shit. No, hold. Okay. Right. Hold I on. mean, I'll be super sad that I don't have my cell phone full of nudes, but it's fine. <laughs> no, hold on. If, okay, Colin, if, if I were twice as smart and I'm able to start a business and make millions of dollars, do you understand? Like, I would, I would hire a Twitter guy. Like, I'd hire a guy to literally just <laughs> a Twitter browse guy, Twitter a Facebook for me. guy, an Instagram yeah. guy. <laughs> <laughs> did you guys, that reminds me. Did you guys hear about how um, Kim Kardashian <laughs> and uh, Kanye West they hired like surrogates to carry around their third child for them? <laughs> that reminds wow. me of that. They hired people to just walk oh around with them God. and hold their 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 infant child with them. Yeah, but I mean. I, th- I think that's a pretty brilliant plan, actually, to make <laughs> enough money so you can pay people to be your dedicated, like, Twitter guy. So, you like, you'll have a Twitter account, but there's someone else managing it, and you tell them what to do. See, all right, exactly. I'm going to have to rethink I- this whole thing, because you guys are just, like, gaming the system <laughs> rather than going to the hard places in this conversation. I- <laughs> Like, look, I'm a loophole finder. That's what I do. Hey, man, we 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 gave you an answer. We gave you answers. All right, what I do know, you want? but it's the, what do you want from us? The, I wanted the interesting answer. It's the uninteresting answer I got, but that's fine. What what's the what 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 are you what are you looking for, Jack? What did you expect? <laughs> no, what to expect? That's what's so funny about this thing, you know. But hey, it's cool. I'll, I'll come up with some more. Uh, but I I feel like I'm gonna be painted in a corner where I'm gonna have to start playing devil's advocate. <laughs> if you Maybe. guys if you guys don't take Possibly. if you guys don't take opposing views and debate them yourselves, so we'll figure it out. This is the first one. I think I think it, it led to some good conversation. I don't know. I'm a fan of this idea of just finding loopholes and would you rather's. <laughs> so instead of the game being would you rather, it's what's the loophole to this would you rather? Yeah, all right. What's the loophole? <laughs> How can you not answer this would you rather? To- Today's logical fallacy. When are we going to have the gorilla versus grizzly bear uh, debate? 
What? Like who gorilla would win in a fight? Grizzly bear? A silverback said, gorilla oh, we, versus we, a we grizzly bear. Right now? No, I'm just bears beats. No, we'll save black. that for the future. But <laughs> I've had that heated debate a couple times in the last year. Okay. Well, I think I should wrap up this episode of the Tiny Disc Podcast. So where can mm. we find you guys online on social media? Uh, Colin and Mono on Twitter. Just search Colin and Mono because I hate, hate I say I hate saying my Twitter handle. It's what? like yeah, it's got two underscores. I thought you secretly loved what? it. Yeah, I I do like I have like I, I think it's just the underscores more than anything. The underscores kind of kill it because it's like you got to make sure there's two underscores in there. But the boo boo is fine. No, yeah, the boo boo's fine. I don't I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey boo boo, got a good picnics, all those jokes hey, and everything. Whatever, oh, man. Hey boo, you're still not gonna say I it, even, dude. I even got a Yogi Bear plushie. So you're still not gonna say it. What? <laughs> I I just said it. The whole thing. Oh, okay. At boo boo five underscore underscore five five. You keep forgetting the underscores. <laughs> Yeah, All right, exactly. That's what I'm saying. I fumble over them every time. That's why I hate okay. Jack. What about uh, you? At J A C C E P E D A on Twitter. Very nice. And you can find me, Robert, at Pin Optimist, P I N O P T I M I S T on Twitter. And I'd also like to plug that I'm going to start doing like video reviews on YouTube. So if you want to cool. check those out, that'd be pretty cool. I will check those out. Yeah. Oh, really? Are What's you? The first? Mm-hmm. Is it a game? Killing Floor 2. Oh, okay. I look forward to seeing that. Oh. Um, Fancy. Yeah, will you say real quick, Colin, one more time, just our uh, since we're on Twitter right now, will you say our podcast Twitter official? Yeah, yeah. So um, if you want to tweet at all of us or uh, come at us with any questions, comments, concerns, what have you, uh, we are at Tiny Disc Podcast on Twitter. No caps, no spaces, at Tiny Disc Podcast. Um, you can also join us on Facebook, where I am the moderator of our lovely official Facebook group, uh, just titled Tiny Disc. Um, so if you search us on Facebook, you should be able to find us uh, Tiny Disc or Tiny Disc Podcast. Uh, just ask for a join invitation and I shall approve it. Mm-hmm. And feel free to tweet at us, too, with the hashtag TDP about what you would rather do. Would you rather be half as smart without with a phone or twice as smart without a phone? For life. It's for life. For life. It's for the rest of your life. OK. <laughs> um, yeah, guys, I want to also point out that we are officially live on the World Wide Webs. Uh, we Woo! are on iTunes. We are on Google Play Music. Uh, you know, definitely help us spread the word. And so to kind of uh, march towards what I like to refer to, you know, in our first year, I'll be transparent about it. We have a goal, guys. We want to get this thing big. We want to get a good base audience here. And this is, you know, in our first year of this podcast, we have a goal of hitting 500 subscribers. And so we cannot do it at all without you guys helping us out. But if you help us out, we're going to help you out. So this is what we want you to do. We need you to go, if you support this podcast, we need you to go to iTunes and give us a five-star review. That's the only way we're going to get visibility on that service and just kind of spread uh, by word of mouth. And if the more five-star reviews we have, the better that'll be. So um, there's a few requirements. We have a contest again. Uh, and it's going to basically put money in your pocket. So um, the amount of the, of the prize depends on how many people participate. But what we need you to do, if you're interested, and if you want to help us out, go on iTunes, give us five stars. Also, we need you to follow us on Twitter. And then we need you also to tweet at us using the hashtag TDP. Um, also, subscribe to our podcast. Once you do all of those things, Um, You will be in the running, and I'm telling you, this is going to be worth your time. This is going to be a prize that is going to really benefit you uh, uh, monetarily-wise, okay? So help us out. Spread uh, spread the podcast by word of mouth. Tell all your friends, um, and, and it could pay off for you, so... That's that's about it. Yeah. But uh, definitely, I uh, look forward to announcing the winner of that in the coming weeks. Uh, but definitely, don't hesitate. Do it now if you can. Appreciate you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, with that, that should wrap us up for this week's episode of the Tiny Disc Podcast. Uh, so tune in next week for another episode. And until next time, we'll see you. Hashtag. Bring on the